preparing the live stream. Just a minute, please. We don't need to start the live stream until 6.30. It takes about a minute for it to go, so it might actually just automatically co coincide. It is now live, Mayor. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. It's now 6.30 p.m. and I'll declare this ordinary council meeting of the town of Victoria Park open. And I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Nanjerapan Wajak Nunga, Wajak Yakin Nija Biliabaduk. I'm honoured to be standing on Wajak Nunga country on the banks of the Swan River. Nankarach Nunga Mort, Ken Karak Nija Wajak Nunga Buja. Nankarach Nija Nunga Rodia Kora. Yay, yay. Order. Balapan Mordich Nunga Kadijan, Mort Webuja Yeye. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and respect past, present, and emerging leaders, their continuing cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land, which continues to be important today. Nanyunka Balapan Nunga, Brodia Wemort Nijabuja. I thank them for the contribution made to life in the town of Victoria Park and to this region. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, in accordance with Clause 39 of the Town of Victoria Park Meeting Procedures Local Law 2019, as the presiding member, I hereby give my permission for the administration to record proceedings of this meeting. Now, this meeting is also being live streamed on the town's website. Uh, by being present at this meeting, members of the public consent to the possibility that their image and voice may be live streamed to the public. Recordings are also made available on the town's website following the meeting. So it is an opportunity to welcome those who are joining us in the electronic meeting tonight uh, in person and also to say welcome to those who've joined uh, watching our meeting on live streaming. We'll now move uh, through a couple more of the announcements from the presiding member, which is item two of our agenda. So public question and public statement time, there are guidelines that do need to be adhered to in our council meetings and during question and statement time, people speaking are not to personalise any questions or statements about elected members or town staff or use any possible defamatory remarks. And further in accordance with clause 40 of our meeting procedures local law, the person addressing the council shall extend due courtesy and respect to the council and the processes under which it operates and comply with any direction by myself, the presiding member. Uh, for this electronic meeting, registrations to attend the meeting were required to be made online. Uh, once people did that, they would then receive a Zoom link which would allow them to join us in the electronic meeting room. Questions and statements that have been received from members of the public prior to this meeting and who are not in attendance will be read out by myself as presiding member and a relevant senior staff member will be called upon to provide answers to any questions if required. Questions and statements related to an agenda item will be considered first. All those dealing with matters of a general nature will be considered in the order in which they have been received. And for those who are joining us live and who do wish to participate during public question and statement time, as per our uh, usual practice, in order to ensure there's fair and equitable opportunity for everyone to ask their questions, Questions are limited to three per person and statements to a maximum of two minutes speaking time. Of course, if there are very few people who are in attendance, uh, we can certainly be more generous with the number of questions per person and the amount of time for statements, but that is our opening guide. Um, so uh, I'd now like to very briefly um, make a number of announcements, which are um, mine and the Mayor's report. So the first one is that this ordinary council meeting for May 2022 is being held by electronic means pursuant to a determination and authorisation that I made under Regulation 14D of the Local Government Administration Regulations 1996, having regard to the continuing state of emergency in Western Australia 
the significant escalation of community transmission of COVID-19 occurring since the 12 April Council meeting, which continues to pose a threat and risk to the health and safety of elected members, town staff and the public from attending in-person meetings. For the Mayor's report um, from April through to May, on the 20th of April, the CEO and I attended a second meeting with the cities of Canning, Gosnells and Palmerdale, where we discussed facilitating a collaborative community services plan and projects, a position statement on sediment control for our rivers, securing bipartisan federal election support for the Restore Our Rivers campaign, and developing a common position for working on MetroNet proposals on the Armadale rail line. On the 21st of April, the CEO and I met with the new CEO of Perth Racing at Belmont Park to discuss uh, Perth Racing's future plans for the race course, the areas surrounding the race course, and of course, opportunities for collaboration with the town for community spaces, which was very encouraging. On the 22nd of April, the CEO and I met with uh, Ms. Hannah Beasley, the member for Victoria Park, to discuss specifically the rezoning of Miller's Crossing in Carlisle following Council's resolution on the 12th of April, 2022, to engage in further advocacy with the Minister for Planning uh, for the WA Government and also Ms Beasley as the member for Victoria Park. On the 27th of April, I attended a meeting of the Municipal Waste Advisory Council run by the WA Local Government Association. On the 1st of May, I opened the annual Dogs Breakfast at Coolbardi Park, Carlisle, and helped judge the town's top dog competition this was a fantastic event showcasing dog friendly businesses in the town and promoting responsible pet ownership. So congratulations uh, on behalf of council to the town's rangers, events, communications and waste management teams who ran the event so successfully and I think was very much appreciated by members of our community and visitors alike um, who came out on a beautiful morning uh, with their furry friends. On the 2nd of May, I met with representatives of the Vic Park Progressives Association to discuss the same issue about rezoning of Miller's Crossing. On 6 May, I attended the WA Local Government Association Mayor's Forum, where we discussed improving culture within councils and also heard directly from the Minister for Local Government about the progress of the Local Government Act reforms, for which community consultation uh, finished earlier in February. That evening, uh, I presented the trophies at the Victoria Park Carlisle Bowling Club's annual awards presentation night. We move now to item three in our agenda, which is attendance. Um, in attendance, we have uh, all elected members save for two. Um, they are Councillor Sandro from the Banksy Award is an apology, as is Councillor Vicky Potter from the JAR Award. Um, we have in attendance a number of staff from the administration, the CEO, Mr. Anthony Valletta, the Chief Operations Officer, Ms. Natalie Adams, the Acting Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Luke Ellis, the Chief Community Planner, Ms. Natalie Martin Good. We also have the Manager of Development Services, Mr. Cruikshank, the Manager of Governance and Strategy, Ms. Brianovic, the Manager of Property Leasing and Development, Mr. Denham, the Manager of People and Culture, Mr. Olson, the Manager of Stakeholder Relations, Ms. Ellis, and our Acting Finance Manager, Ms. Ursich. Um, we're supported tonight by the Minute Secretary, Ms. Horner, and meeting support, Ms. Louise. Item 3.2 is approved leave of absence. We have no one on an approved leave of absence. So that moves us to item four, which is declarations of interest. Mr. CEO, do we have any declarations of interest, please? Uh, yes, we, yes, we do, Madam Mayor. Uh, item 11, Councillor Jesse Hamer, impartiality interest for the electors that submitted motions unknown to me, uh, being Beck Rager, Vince Maxwell, Sam Zammett and Melanie Lund. Item 11.2, Councillor Jesmyn Karimi, an impartiality interest the following persons are known to me, Rebecca Rager and boss Naomi Chapman. Uh, item 11.2, Mayor Karen Vernon, impartiality interest. I had a meeting last week with three people who attended the annual meeting of electors, Paul and Caroline Vandermeer and Amy Holsworth, regarding the officer's response to several of the electors motions. Item 11.4, Council President Peter Devereaux, impartiality interest. Uh, I'm a, an adjunct, adjunct uh, research fellow at Curtin University. Item 11.4, Mayor Karen Vernon, impartiality interest. In the past, I've attended events in my role as Mayor at the Invitation of Telephone Community Cinemas and John Curtin Gallery, recommended for approval. I've previously met with the Director 
of Curate recommended for refusal regarding opportunities for their organisation to host events within the town. Item 11.4, Councillor Wilfred Hendricks, impartiality interests. I know members of the Ascot Rotary Club. Uh, item 12.1, Councillor Jesse Hamer, uh, impartiality interests. I received a call and an email from Planning Solutions about this matter. Item 12.1, Councillor Peter Devereux, impartiality interests. I received two emails and a phone call from Joshua Carmody of Planning Solutions about this. Item 12.1, Councillor Jesse Hamer, impartiality interest. The chief at Blast Brewery is known to me. He mentioned the upcoming item in conversation. Item 12.1, Councillor Bronwyn Ife, impartiality interest. I received phone calls and emails from Planning Solutions on this issue. Item 12.2, uh, Mr. Anthony Belletta, impartiality interest. I've met with the tenants at a number of events over the last few years. Uh, sorry, I believe that's uh, item 12.1, correction. Uh, item uh, uh, 13.1, Mayor Karen Vernon, impartiality interest. I've had meetings and conversations with the Friends of Jeddah at Bushland regarding their ongoing interests in the restoration of Kent Street Sandpit site from time to time of their petition and their petition to council until present. And item 13.1, Council Wilfred Hendricks, an impartiality interest. I've had attended and been involved in events run by this group. Um, and item 22.1.1, Mr. Anthony Valletta, financial interests as the cost, uh, costs may benefit me in the position of CEO. That's it, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Valletta. Um, so I now need to make a further declaration of interest um, and I'll ask if other elected members have declarations of interest that they have not made that they would wish to make. So I would like to make a declaration of interest in relation to item 12.1, uh, it's impartiality. Um, I have received emails and a voice message from Planning Solutions on that item. Uh, Ms Horner, were you able to record that information? I've recorded that and a hard copy will be needing to be sent. Thank you. Thank you. I will submit that. So I'm now going to um, invite elected members who have yet to make declarations of interest that are aware um, to do so, uh, starting with Deputy Mayor Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to um, declare an impartiality for 12.1, as I have also received a phone call and emails from Planning Solutions, and I will send a hard copy through to governance. Thank you. Thank you. And that's your only declaration of interest? Thank you. Uh, Councillor I. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Um, I would like to declare an interest in 11.4, in addition to the interest I've already declared for 12.1. Uh, 11.4, because I have attended um, an event hosted by Telethon Community Cinemas, and I will submit that in writing straight away. Thank you, Councillor I for 11.4. Councillor Hendricks. We're just um, on 12.1, I've also received an email from Planning Solutions. I'll send a copy. Thank you. All right, so that's an impartiality interest for you, Councillor Hendricks. Impartiality interest, yep. Thank you. Councillor Karimi. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. I also need to declare an impartiality interest for item 12.1, as I too have received a phone call and an email from Planning Solutions. Thank you. All right, thank you. So that's impartiality for 12.1 for Councillor Karimi. Um, sorry, I just repeated that, Councillor Karimi, because your sound cut out ever so slightly in the middle of you speaking, but I'm sure Ms Horner caught it, as did I. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Valletta. Yes, Madam Mayor, I made a correction in my reading out of the declarations. Uh, mine actually was right. So item 12.2 is the item I'm declaring impartiality interest on, but it appears as though Councillor Hamers mentions 12.1 um, and the Chief at Blaster Breweries, which I think is associated with 12.2. So I just wanted to make sure that was corrected if, he's, if he, he can confirm. All right, uh, Councillor Hamer, so uh, your connection uh, with staff at Blaster Brewing, uh, are you happy to confirm that relates to item 12.2 on the agenda for impartiality tonight, not item 12.1? Yes, that is correct. Thank you, Ms. Vernon. Thank you. 
Thank you. So, uh, sorry, I was getting a message on my screen telling me I was muted and much as many of you would probably wish that I get that message often, uh, that particular time it didn't turn out to be real. So there you go. Um, so thank you for that. If any other elected members um, or uh, members of staff have uh, declarations of interest, um, please announce them prior to the item coming up for deliberation. Uh, we'll now move on with items on our agenda. So we now move to item five, which is public uh, question time and item 5.1 and 5.2 responses to previous public questions taken on notice at both the Ordinary Council meeting on the 12th of April and the Agenda Briefing Forum held on the 3rd of May 2022 are found in the agenda for this meeting. So now move to 5.3, which is public question time. And I have not yet checked with um, our meeting support member, Ms. Louise. Do we have any members of the community who've joined us live at this time? We do have six uh, in attendance, but I believe some of those will be for the deputation. All right, uh, thank you, Ms. Louise. So uh, we'll proceed. We have had um, some uh, questions that have been submitted in advance. And so on the basis that neither of those questions submitted in advance relate to any item on tonight's agenda, although perhaps one of them may be considered loosely to do so, um, I'll read that one first uh, and then the other one second before inviting any of the members of the public who've joined us tonight live in the online room if they would like to ask any questions. So the first question is from Curtis Greening, which I will read out. Uh, and it indicates, uh, regarding people in the community who've been affected by COVID-19, does the council have any intent to represent or advocate for people like me with these concerns? Um, so, in relation to uh, that question, um, going to direct that to our Manager of Governance and Strategy, Ms. Branovic. Uh, through the Chair, um, I am unable to respond on behalf of Council, but I believe that a lot of uh, similar questions were raised at the annual electors meeting and responses were given, and also um, a lot of uh, what has been asked in this question is outlined in the report um, from the annual electors meeting about advocacy and various other things. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ms. Brayanovich. Uh, so um, I can further add to that by saying to Mr. Greening, uh, whether or not council has such an intention to engage in representation or advocacy of that nature, will depend on the outcome of the debate on item 11.2, which is on our agenda for decision tonight. So at this stage, uh, during public question time, um, we're not in a position to answer that question for you. Uh, next question uh, is from Derek Williamson, which I will read out. It says, uh, I live next to McCallum Park and compared to Burswood and South Perth, the park is in bad shape from the lawns condition, parking in no standing area, parking on verge and nighttime gathering around the basketball court. Which councillor is in charge? Direct that question to Ms Brainovic. Uh, to the chair, McCallum Park falls under the Jera ward and the councillors for this ward are Ive Karimi, Councillor Hamer and Councillor Potter. Um, but in saying that any community member can report if reserves need maintenance, including watering or illegal parking to the town through the website or by calling customer service. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Branovich. I would also add for the benefit um, of our community member, Mr. Williamson, who asked that question, no councillor is in charge of the operational matters of the town relating to the upkeep and maintenance of parks 
We are, however, responsible for adopting an annual budget, um, which puts money towards the upkeep of our public open spaces. Um, and you are welcome to contact any of the town's councillors, regardless of their ward. As well, you are very welcome to contact me as the mayor. Um, I believe that I am the elected member who lives closest to, elect to McCallum Park, um, if that's uh, <laughs> any interest uh, to Mr Williamson. But yes, we welcome you either notifying the town of specific issues you have or contacting elected members uh, both in your ward and outside of it. Our details are on the town's website. Um, now, that is the end of the questions that had been pre-submitted. So I will now ask whether there are any other persons who are present in our meeting tonight who would like to ask any questions. And you'll just need to make yourself known to me uh, by switching on your microphone and identifying yourself. Well, they do say that silence is golden. I am hoping uh, that it is a golden silence and nobody is having difficulty unmuting themselves or indicating that they have a question that they would like to share with us. Um, if you are staying with us for the duration, we do have a second opportunity for public question time later on at the end of the meeting. I think I just spoke over the top of someone, so somebody might be trying to get my attention. They need to raise their electronic hand, Mayor. Uh, yes, so um, if you do have a question to ask, you can use your electronic raise hand function, which you should find somewhere towards the bottom of your screen. Um, and once you click that on, it will come to my attention on the participants list. And I'll be able to hopefully go to you. Uh, so I'm not seeing anyone's hands raised. Uh, so on that basis, I take it that there are no questions from any members of the community who have joined us tonight. So on that basis, um, a little bit of a going, going, gone. Uh, at 6.51pm, I declare public question time closed. Uh, we'll now move to uh, the next item on our agenda, which is public statement time, which is item six. We do have some pre-submitted statements uh, and a number of them do relate to items that are on uh, tonight's agenda. So I will read those out uh, in the order in which we have received them at the request of those persons. So the first statement that I read out is from John Robertson on behalf of Williams and Hughes lawyers um, in relation to item 12.2. Title of this statement is Objection to Amendment to Town Planning Scheme Number One to, mit, to permit a tavern at number 98 to 106 Woodward Parade, Burswood. We act for Burswood Corporation Pity Limited, the registered owner of a nearby site at 84 to 88 Goodwood Parade, Burswood. We are instructed relevantly as follows. One, our client's town planner, Dynamic, has highlighted concerns about the Town of Victoria Park's proposed amendments to the presentation to the Ordinary Council meeting scheduled for 17 May 2022. Two, Dynamic had made a submission on behalf of Burswood Corporation by the closing date for comments on 6 May 2022. Three, Dynamic then followed up the Town of Victoria Park to see when the matter would be presented to an agenda briefing session, only to find this had occurred on 3 May 2022 and was not disclosed. This was unorthodox as an agenda briefing session is a platform for interested parties to attend and discuss matters of concern. The opportunity to do so has now purportedly been lost. Four, it is not readily apparent why the Town of Victoria Park has chosen to proceed in such an irregular and unfair manner, such that it will impact on Burswood Corporation's ability to engage in the process before the matter is scheduled for presentation to a council meeting. Five, Burswood Corporation seeks an explanation from the Town of Victoria Park as to how and why the agenda brief report could be prepared and finalised in the absence of submissions being fully and completely considered. Six, Burswood Corporation will now take legal advice on options for judicial review of the administrative process the town has undertaken, including whether injunctive relief is available to Burswood Corporation before the formal amendment process commences. Seven, Burswood Corporation is concerned it has been denied the ability to present a deputation at a forum where councillors were able to ask 
informal questions of officers to guide their decision made before the ordinary council meeting. Eight, Burswood Corporation's strong preference is for the town to remove this agenda item and allow it to return to an agenda briefing session. And if it does not occur, Burswood Corporation will consider legal alternatives to prevent the public comment process from commencing. Reasons for this include the town's failure to follow its own prescribed procedures, which of itself is cause for concern. Burswood Corporation reserves its rights against the town of Victoria Park. The next statement is from Jeremy Hoffland on behalf of Row Group. Um, to be read out by myself as presiding member. It also relates to item 12.2. It reads, on behalf of Blaster Brewing Co, as proponent of the proposed scheme amendment request, we provide the following statement and request that it be read out at the meeting by the presiding member. We have reviewed the agenda report in relation to our request as prepared by the town staff and are supportive of the content and recommendation. We note that preliminary consultation has been undertaken in accordance with the relevant provisions of the town's local planning policy 37, with clause 1B of this policy stating that council will undertake community consultation prior to determining whether or not to initiate a scheme amendment. Given that the preliminary community consultation process was concluded prior to council's consideration, with copies of submissions incorporated within the council agenda, to inform its determination of the request, we are of the view that the town has followed the process outlined in its policy. We note that should council resolve to initiate the scheme amendment, the proposal would be subject to a further public consultation period of 42 days in accordance with part five, division three of the planning and development local planning schemes regulations 2015, which would provide interested parties with an opportunity to prepare a detailed submission on the proposal and also to address council at a future meeting following the conclusion of the consultation process. The town in its assessment of the request has stated at paragraph 15 of its report that the use of the site as a tavern satisfies a number of the objectives for the precinct as proposed by scheme amendment 82 and draft local planning policy 40 and could be considered as an appropriate land use within the precinct. In summary, we consider that it is open to council to determine whether to initiate the amendment at its meeting this evening. For the reasons noted above and within the staff report, we respectfully request that council resolve to initiate the amendment in accordance with the staff recommendation. The next pre-submitted statement uh, is from Klaus Backauer on behalf of the Friends of Jerderup Bushland to be read out by myself in relation to item 13.1, Kent Street Sandpit uh, Site Concept Plan. The statement reads, the Friends of Jerderup Bushland would like to state that we are very supportive of the recommendation for Council to endorse the Kent Street Sandpit concept design as per, town, as per tonight's agenda item 13.1 Kent Street Sandpit concept design. The concept design plan revision C is now based on site surveys and the geotechnical reports and incorporates environmental aspects like rainbow bee eater nesting sites. In addition, recommendations from Indigenous representatives like Elder Professor Simon Forrest and Daryl Bellotti, as well as from the Friends, have been considered and informed this design. We thank the Town of Victoria Park for engaging and working together with the Friends on this plan. We'd also like to thank Mayor Karen Vernon and all councillors for backing this project and supporting the Friends' vision for a Banksia woodland restoration for this site. As Professor Kingsley Dixon recently said, the main objective for the sandpit is to re-establish a Banksia woodland where there is none and make it accessible to the community. By endorsing the concept plan, we'll be able to move on to the next stage, that is the detailed design preparation and the restoration plan development. With the expertise from, from Professor Dixon's Curtin University team and the passion and enthusiasm from all involved, this project has the potential to become a benchmark for Banksia woodland restoration throughout the Perth metropolitan area. The Friends look forward to providing further input to the restoration plan and detailed design phase and working towards a best practice ecological and cultural restoration of the site. The next statement is from Caroline Vandermey for the presiding member to read out and it states, it is easy to think that the mandates affect only a few fringe people. The town of Victoria Park was fast becoming a vibrant, buzzing cafe strip and welcoming family-friendly area to shop, meet friends and eat. Then with COVID and restrictions, the cafe strip and shopping area has been hard hit. Between people not wanting or being able to attend these areas, 
wearing masks and social distancing. This affects the businesses in your area as well as those living here. Businesses are struggling with having clients and customers, trying to implement new rules, trying to assess how to comply with following mandates, and in some cases, having to put on staff to check passport and impinge on people's private medical records. There have been staff losses, which also cost money with training new staff. Businesses have also had additional costs of purchasing and putting up signs regarding social distancing and mask wearing and trying to police these. There is also the unseen cost of business insecurity because businesses don't know what is ahead. They are not expanding and many are not starting. Look how many retail vacancies are around. Whilst you may think the mandates affect a small group of people, the effect is far more widespread. And whilst bigger businesses may be able to wear the cost of following these mandates, the effect on small business is noticeable. The next statement um, pre-submitted is from Curtis Greening to be read out by the presiding member. It states, I reside, own property, pay rates, own a business, employ people and service businesses and members of the public in Burswood. My experience is not unique. It is very much a growing mainstream experience and perception. Our business and our personal and my personal life has been dramatically affected by government action and inaction in relation to the current health crisis. Government has missed, missed and overstepped what their involvement should be in a free society and liberal democracy. My health has been dramatically affected as a result of taking the Pfizer vaccine, mainly via significant and lasting cardiovascular side effects. Our business has been massively affected by mandatory closures, lockdowns, border restrictions, mask mandates, and vaccine mandates. I have had COVID, as have many people I know, and the effects of it have not warranted the kind of mandates and restrictions put in place on the community. Though this last point of the health consequences of having COVID are very relevant, I also believe the government decisions that have been made are undemocratic and have no place in a free society in any context. In relation to these issues, something I'm personally passionate about, I feel isolated from and misrepresented by the council, as well as state and federal levels of government. I am disappointed in the perceived stance that the council has taken on all of this, as this is my local level of government that should be most perceptive and in touch with their legitimate stakeholders in the context of the council's function as a representative and dem democratic form of government that allows the community freedom of expression and enables individuals and businesses to practice their basic freedoms and liberties. That concludes the pre-submitted statements. Are there any members uh, of our community of attendance tonight who would like to make a statement? Uh, Amy Holdsworth first. And please proceed when you're ready. Uh, you have two minutes. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Um, good evening. My, my statement um, relates to, not surprisingly, the electors resolution 6, 7, 8 and 9 from the annual electors meeting. Amongst all of the motions that were presented and passed at the electors meeting, which on tonight's agenda for your consideration, there is one commonality. When you sit here this evening and vote on the action for council to take, you're making a public statement on this issue, this commonality. This has been an issue in our community for many months and has been with council for consideration for several weeks. This issue is, do we support segregation and discrimination in our community? And a related question is, at what cost are we purporting to be saving lives? You may think this to be an oversimplification, but I don't believe that is the case. Right now, we have people in this town who have been forced to take an experimental drug in order to keep their employment. I am sorry if this is an uncomfortable sentence to hear, but it is true. I know it is true because my own employer told me I could no longer work for them unless I took an experimental drug. My use of the term experimental is because the TGA, which is the governing body responsible for approving pharmaceuticals for supply in Australia, has only provisionally approved the products being marketed as COVID vaccines and clinical trials are ongoing. An extract from the TGA's website from consumer medicine information supplied by Pfizer for their community product states, this vaccine has provisional approval in Australia to prevent COVID-19 disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus in adults and adolescents from 12 years of age and older. This approval has been granted on the basis of short-term safety and efficacy data. 
evidence of longer term efficacy and safety from ongoing clinical trials and vaccination in the community continues to be gathered and assessed. Consumer medicine information on the TTA website for the Vaxervia product, formerly known as AstraZeneca, includes very rare cases of blood clots with low levels of blood platelets have been observed following vaccination with Vaxervia. The majority of these cases occurred within the first 21 days following vaccination, but have also been reported after this period. Some had a fatal outcome. I read that and I say they are still working on the science and still experimenting on the products. It should be expected and actually encouraged for any person to be hesitant about involving themselves and their families in this type of trial. These same people should never have been coerced into taking a product through threat of their livelihoods. It is just so wrong. We teach children to be free thinkers, to critically analyze their environment and make informed decisions so they can grow into well-rounded and well-grounded adults. We are setting an example for future generations right now that it is okay to treat some people a certain way because of, the, because of their medical choices. We have also seen that the provision for any and all mandates to be reintroduced has been extended through to January. Meanwhile, the state government is actively funding international tourism campaigns, encouraging people to visit WA in a state of emergency. How is it safe for tourists to holiday here, but not safe for me to be in the workplace? If you don't Ms. agree Holdsworth, with Holdsworth, you have 30 seconds. Okay. We are asking for advocacy from this council to use their collective louder voice and report to the state government this town does not and will not support segregation and discrimination. We are asking council to engage with government ministers and locally elected members to report the harm that has been caused by the government's pandemic response. This would go a long way towards demonstrating that everyone is welcomed in Victoria Park and we would not allow anyone to feel that they are less worthy or less deserving. We would teach our children that it is not okay to discriminate against others based on their private medical information. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ms. Holdsworth. Um, so the next person is uh, Paul Vandermey. Um, now, in fairness, um, Ms. Holdsworth um, did go over the two minute mark. So Mr. Holt, uh, Mr. Vandermey, um, you can make a statement. I'll, I'll allow your statement to be three minutes. Um, obviously, if there are no other people who wish to make statements, we do have capacity to come back to you. And uh, you're reading on my screen as um, a couple, as Paul and Caroline. So I'm not sure which of you is wanting to speak. I've just gone with um, Paul Vandermey as your name appears first. So um, proceed when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mayor Vernon. It is Paul Vandermeer. You have already read a statement from my wife, Caroline. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm also talking about uh, item 11.2 resolutions, um, uh, primarily six and eight. Uh, I want to address the question of discrimination uh, first. Uh, as a society, the concept of discrimination is legislated in a way that discrimination is not acceptable. Uh, we think uh, along these lines in uh, bullying, race, sex, age, religious and medical discrimination. Uh, the mandates that we're facing and seeking advocacy against are discriminating against individuals based on a choice that is required to be made freely with full knowledge and without coercion. Uh, the town taking an anti-discrimination stance to support its residents and electors is working within and towards society's anti-discrimination intent. Uh, discrimination in one place allows discrimination everywhere. Uh, a vote to support this advocacy uh, demonstrates your non-discriminatory stance in society. Uh, note that the Human Rights Commissioner is reported as having expressed concern about the West Australian uh, vaccine mandates breaching the human rights of Western Australians and demonstrating that uh, the request for adv advocacy is in, uh, uh, is in good company. Uh, I note that the officer comments uh, made against uh, Resolution 6 at least, and uh, I believe some others, uh, give the impression that this uh, COVID-19 vaccination pro-choice statement advocacy uh, does not align with the town's intentions. However, policy 105, the criteria for advocacy projects, uh, does include social uh, issues and matters uh, in line with strategic outcomes and objectives uh, of the town's strategic community plan. 
the town strategic community plan uh, includes the uh, mega trend of social inclusion and expectations. And I'll just pick out three elements there. It's basically having access to employment, which is removed by employment mandates, uh, education, which is removed by institutional mandates within the town, uh, such as what's been done at Curtin University, and opportunities to establish and maintain social networks, uh, which is removed by things like vaccine passport requirements. You have 30 seconds remaining, Mr. Vandermeer. Thank you. Uh, from the, uh, the social strategic outcomes, the, under the heading where we're, he where we're headed, um, includes a place where all can work, which again is affected by the mandates. And under the economic headings, uh, strategic outcomes, a desirable place that supports diverse local employment. So there are a couple of areas that um, are in the plan and do suggest that it is actually a suitable thing at, to advocate for. Uh, we're requesting advocacy, uh, which is not much compared to legal action that the town of Port Hedland is planning. And your support for advocacy resolutions demonstrate your commitment to the type of society we all want to live in, a society where, with opportunities and without discrimination. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vandermeer. Is there anyone else in the electronic meeting room who would wish to make a statement? No, I'm not seeing any electronic hands raised. So um, thank you uh, to Ms. Holdsworth and Mr. Vandermeer um, for taking the time to make a statement to us tonight. Uh, at 7.10 p.m. I'll declare um, our public statement time is closed. Thank you. So we'll now move on to um, the remainder of our agenda. Item seven is confirmation of minutes and receipt of notes from any agenda briefing forum. The recommendation is that council one confirms the minutes of the ordinary council meeting held on 12 April 2022. Secondly, receives the notes of the agenda briefing forum held on 3rd of May 2022. And third, receives the notes of the hockey working group meeting held on 17 March 2022. And finally, receives the notes of the Madeira advisory group meeting held on 13 April 2022. Using electronic voting uh, elected members, can I get you please to uh, use your electronic voting buttons and seeking a mover and a seconder, please for the recommendation. Uh, Councillor I, uh, do you have a question? I do, Mayor Vernon. Um, for some reason, I've got my um, electronic um, agenda up, but I have no button to press to vote or move or second. And I'm not sure why, and I'm not sure if there's a staff member who can fix that for me. Um, well, uh, we may or may not have someone who can assist with that. Um, as a first step, have you tried actually exiting Docs on Tap and re-entering it in order to see if that resets the system? I've tried it once, I'm gonna try it again. All right, while you were trying that, um, Ms. Louise, is there anyone who can assist Councillor I um, to access her electronic voting buttons on Docs on Tap? Uh, that would be through uh, Natasha and Banner and Governance, may have been. All right, thank you. Um, so, Ms Horner, um, is there anything that you can send a message to Councillor Ife to see if it can assist? Otherwise, we'll have to look at a backup plan. If you tell me that all other elected members um, have been pressing buttons and we have a mover and a seconder, it suggests that no one else has got the same problem as Councillor Ife and we might need to take Councillor Ife's votes in a more traditional manner. I can confirm that I am receiving votes from other elected members and should be displayed on the screen. If Councillor Ife is having further difficulties, we may have to do manual voting or she can message me. All right, well, if, 
Thank you. If I could ask you at this stage, could you display the mover and the seconder, please, for this item first? And then we'll take it from there because where we have no dissent, we might be able to dispense with electronic voting for a number of matters. Anyway, Councillor I. The little button's back. All is well with the world. Thank you. And my apologies. Great. Not a problem at all. So moved myself, Mayor Vernon, seconded Deputy Mayor Anderson. Is there any dissent? I'm currently not seeing all elected members at once on my screen, so you just need to give me a minute till for me to pop through the list. Um, I'm not seeing any indications of dissent, and please, elected members, if you think that I have overlooked you, you can always use your electronic hand because that will get my attention potentially quicker. Um, so there being no dissent, uh, I declare that matter carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to the next item on the agenda. Which is item eight. Temporarily a few too many screens open. Uh, item eight is presentation of minutes from external bodies. The recommendation is that council receives the minutes of the Tamala Park Regional Ordinary Council meeting held on 21 April 2022. Can I seek a mover and a seconder, please, for that? Still seeking a seconder. So uh, moved Deputy Mayor Anderson, seconded Councillor Karimi, uh, sorry, Councillor Hamer, sorry, bad eyesight, I have had an eye test, I'm getting new glasses, hopefully that'll help. Um, is there any dissent? No, there being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously, thank you. We'll now move on to item nine on our agenda, which is presentations. 9.1 is petitions, we have none. 9.2 is presentations, we have none. 9.3 is deputations. Now we have received elected members, uh, a number of requests for deputations and in accordance with our meeting procedures local law, we will need to resolve to permit those deputations to take place. So the recommendation that uh, I will move is that council receive the following deputations. Regarding item 12.1, request for amendment to town planning scheme number one to rezone land at numbers 176 and 178, lots 20 and 21, Swansea Street, East, East Victoria Park. First, Mr. Aaron Lohman from Element WA and Mr. Scott Greenwood from Hawaiian. Secondly, Mr. James Lewison from Element WA on behalf of the Perrin Group. And third, Mr. Ben Doyle from Planning Solutions on behalf of the applicant Niche Living. So I've moved that. Can I have a seconder, please? Uh, seconded Councillor Ife. Is there any dissent? There being no dissent indicated, I declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. So uh, we are now going to proceed uh, in order for the presentations, for deputations. Each of the presenters should be aware that they have uh, 10 minutes to make their deputation. If more than one person is intending to speak during the deputation, if you would be so kind uh, as to introduce yourselves so that elected members can hear um, the names that go with the voices, since we probably won't be in a position to see you. So I am going to call on uh, the first person that we authorised, which is Mr. Aaron Lohman and Mr. Scott Greenwood, please. We would like to commence when you're ready. 
Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. It's just in the first instance, checking that you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to present tonight. I have with me uh, Scott Greenwood from Hawaiian, who will, uh, who will also present this deputation. Tonight, we ask Council not to support the scheme amendment as recommended by the town's officers. As Council be, will be aware, the proposal seeks to facilitate a mixed-use development, including a retail tenancy of 2,000 square metres, 2,300 square metres, I should say, which is an increase uh, from the current 1,600 square metres of floor space occupied by the existing market. The rezoning proposed as it stands does not provide a limitation on retail floor space, and this is one of our primary concerns. Whilst the scheme amendment document refers to the retail existing markets, which is the existing 600 square, 1,600 square metres of retail floor space, there is no provision for this to be contained within the scheme amendment that's apparent, nor does there appear to be any obligation on behalf of the applicant to do so. This coupled with no limitation on the retail floor space, is it very much open for the establishment of an unplanned node of retail development. Hawaiian are concerned in respect to the expansion of retail floor space, especially without limitation such as proposed by the scheme amendment proposal and the accumulative effect of other proposals in the locality. As Council will be aware, there is a proposed Woolworths development with 4,750 square metres of retail floor space approximately, which is 150 metres from the site, and this is in addition to an existing Aldi, which is approximately 280 metres away. Under the Town's Draft Activity Centre Strategy of 2017, it concluded the modelled retail floor space for 2020, sorry, for 2031, is shown as 2,100 square metres, and this is for the Oak Street activation area. Evidently, the Woolworths development would exceed this floor space being 4,750 square metres. This is an important point. <clears throat> we note there's no needs assessment or impact test provided with the scheme amendment to determine that it, the additional floor space proposed is acceptable and would not impact on the hierarchy of, of existing centres. This is considered contrary to the West Australian Planning Commission's draft statement of planning policy SPP 4.2 activity centres, the draft of which was considered at the meeting of the West Australian Planning Commission on, in March 2022. Therefore, we expect that final adoption is imminent. In respect to the site, the draft local planning strategy also identifies four separate actions. The actions relevant to the proposal are, the Oak Street neighbourhood is designated as a precinct planning area and a precinct structure plan or similar should be prepared to guide future planning. Moreover, that the existing town planning scheme level one zones and densities should be transitioned until such investi planning investigations and precinct plans is completed. The scheme amendment seeks to move ahead of these investigations of precinct planning foreshadowed within the local planning strategy without a holistic consideration of the potential outcomes for the precinct. The proposal will further introduce high density residential development into an industrial area. This is contrary to the West Australian Planning Commission's sub regional planning framework, which comments that it's important to note in existing industrial areas within the central sub region continue to operate effectively and allow for adaptive land use that's informed by market without threat of encroachment or replacement by sensitive land uses such as residential. The proposal is primary residential development. It is our understanding and experience that there's a general presumption of rezoning of industrial land for alternative uses given the employment opportunities and the industry on such land. The proposal would remove a supply of industrial land and potentially fed up the use of existing uh, surrounding industrial development by the introduction of high density residential development and additional mitigation measures that such industrial activities would have in terms of noise, dust and light pollution. We note that the proposal contains the existing Swansea Street market, which includes several tenancies. The applicant advocates that the building is, is nearing its life and requires redevelopment. However, we question whether the retaining of the Swansea market requires the development of 165 apartments at a significantly high density and the removal of industrial land. That is, the retention of the Swansea markets in a manner proposed introduces a significant opportunity for land use conflicts and is contrary to orderly and proper planning. 
Moreover, the scheme amendment, as it's proposed, does not seem to actually secure the market use. We consider for the reasons previously stated that the scheme amendment should not be initiated by the town, as there is significant doubt that, as there may also be significant doubt that the proposal would ultimately be successful, given the conflict with the local and state planning framework and future planning processes foreshadowed by the draft LPS. In this regard, the scheme amendment is also considered a spot rezoning as it lacks holistic consideration and planning of the locality as required by the town's draft LPS and advocated by the officers. I'd now like to pass over to Scott Greenwood from Hawaiian to discuss the proposal further. Uh, good, ev good evening, everyone. Scott Greenwood, I'm the General Manager of Shopping Centres for, for Hawaiian. Clearly, I'm rep representing Hawaiian's interests, but I would also like to make it clear that I'm representing the interests of nearly 60 retailers at Hawaiian's Park Centre, most of whom are mum and dad, small business owners, um, and also the hundreds of staff that work at Hawaiian's Park Centre every week. Uh, an oversupply of retail floor space, particularly new supermarkets, and I would like to remind you of you know, just along Albany Highway, there's a Woolworths in Victoria Park, uh, an IGA in East Victoria Park, of course, the Coles at Park Centre, an Audi in East Victoria Park, a proposed Woolworths in East Victoria Park, and, and now this proposal. Um, those new supermarkets have the potential to make a significant negative impact on Hawaiian's Park Centre and certainly our retailers. The 2,300 square metres of retail floor, plate, floor, floor space proposed and the fact that no limitation of retail floor space is contained within the scheme amendment could lead to the development of a new supermarket, which would be an anchor for the establishment of a new retail centre. The establishment of new out of centre development and the cumulative impact on unplanned retail floor space erodes the ongoing viability and opportunity to invest in existing centres such as Hawaiian's Park Centre. Just as an example, uh, we, Hawaiian, have invested more than $11.3 million into the Park Centre over the last 10 years. That includes ambience upgrades, and tenant incentives. And that does not talk to the amount of money that's been invested by retailers in their own businesses in our shopping centre. Future investment is certainly at risk if unplanned and in our view, unnecessary retail space is approved such as what is being proposed. Uh, retail landlords and small business owners have suffered as a result of COVID-19. We heard that uh, from a public member of the public earlier on tonight, the hierarchy of existing activity centres must be supported to ensure existing centres remain viable. A key policy outcome of the draft SPP 4.2 includes discouraging out of centre development that undermines the hierarchy of activity centres. We understand in reviewing the agenda report that the town's officers have also have concerns regarding the activity centre hierarchy and location of retail land uses in this proposal. I'll hand back over to Aaron. Um, thank you. Just, just to summarise, um, the concerns are really raised in respect to the development of out of centre development and ad hoc retail development that undermines the hierarchy of activity centres. And we say the scheme amendment as presented does not consider- Two minute left potential impact. Ultimately, a dispersion of retail activity away from designated centres draws away from establishing centres, which in turn erodes the ongoing viability and opportunity to invest. It is requested that council in making its decision as to whether to initiate the amendment, consider this point and the need to maintain healthy and vibrant centres. This is especially so for the park centre, which is a district centre under state planning policy 4.2 in both the current and draft versions and the local planning strategy also advocates the area to which it's contained be upgraded to a secondary centre. Thank you for your time, councillors.
Thank you, Mr. Lohman and Mr. Greenwood. Uh, elected members, do any of you have any questions for either representative? No, I'm not seeing any uh, elected member hands go up. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, both of you, for attending tonight um, to make your deputation. Uh, you're, of course, welcome to remain in the electronic meeting room for um, any part of the remainder of our meeting. Um, we will now be moving on to the next approved uh, deputation, um, which is Mr. James Lewison from Element WA on behalf of the Heron Group. So, Mr. Lewison, um, when you are ready, um, please commence and you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, just confirming everyone can hear me. Okay, thank you. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, as the Mayor mentioned, my name is James Lewison and I'm here from Element uh, this evening representing Perrin Group, who are owners of Belmont Forum Shopping Centre in the adjacent suburb of Cloverdale. I appreciate the opportunity to make the, this a deputation this evening. The Victoria Park community are a key user group of services and amenities provided by Belmont Forum. Perrin lodged a submission objecting to the proposed amendment during the public submission period. On this basis, we support the town's planning assessment and recommendation to not initiate the amendment this evening. The proposed amendment is a spot rezoning and may compromise the future planning and development of this area and the wider precinct, including the future Oates Street Activity Centre. This amendment has the potential to result in poorer outcomes for the Victoria Park community over an extended period. The matters I will identify in this deputation demonstrate that the proposed amendment is not a good planning proposal and should not be supported by council. I note that although this amendment is being proposed by a landowner at this stage, it will become the town's amendment and responsibility if council choose to initiate the amendment this evening. As will be outlined in this deputation, the Western Australian Planning Commission or WAPC is unlikely to support the amendment in our view, potentially wasting the town's time and resources. There is no certainty that the applicant will develop the site in accordance with the concept plan or attain the existing grocery tenant. There is also no requirement for the applicant to undergo this amendment in such a rushed process to replace the supermarket in a like for like size as they have stated. Council recently endorsed a draft local planning strategy following public advertising. We understand this is now with the WAPC for assessment and is therefore a well progressed and seriously entertained strategic planning document for Victoria Park. The proposed amendment is entirely inconsistent with the land use designation under the draft local planning strategy. The subject site is identified as industrial pursuant to the draft local planning strategy as displayed in figure two of the draft strategy and is located outside the area around Oat Street Station identified for future precinct planning. It is noted that the applicant report does not address that the applicant does not address this matter in their report. It is understood that this area may be reviewed for different land uses in the future, subject to detailed investigations and further planning processes. As indicated by the town's draft local planning strategy, there is no certainty that this industrial area will change in the future. The town's draft local planning strategy provides an extensive list of the strategic matters which, needs to be, which need to be considered worked through and addressed in the future planning of this activity centre and the surrounding area. The proposed amendment will proceed without this vital step in the planning process, potentially jeopardising the future development and operation of the activity centre. These relevant matters which need to be planned for and addressed by detailed precinct planning are outlined in the town's draft local planning strategy and are summarised as follows. Potential relocation of the Oat Street train station as part of the Metronet level crossing removal project. Appropriate boundaries for the neighbourhood activity centre. The merits of retaining industrial land and uses. The potential to transition all or part of the industrial zone to mixed commercial and residential land uses. I note this is still undetermined and requires detailed planning processes to proceed and the need for a buffer between residential land uses and the existing industrial land uses. 
The town's strategic planning document, such as the revised activity centre strategy and the draft local planning strategy, identify the area, specifically the Oates Street activity centre, as requiring a neighbourhood centre. The proposed development has the potential to entirely fulfil that need, removing the ability to establish the Oates Street activity centre adjacent to the train station in the future. This would be a significant missed opportunity for this community and the wider population. State planning policy 4.2 identifies Oates Street as a district centre. However, the town's strategic planning framework recommends it be considered a neighbourhood centre as identified previously. This uncertainty requires a more detailed needs assessment undertaken as a part of and based on a detailed planning process. Without knowing the composition of the activity centre and the surrounding area, the need for retail and commercial land uses within the activity centre cannot be determined. The applicant has not assessed the proposed amendment against draft state planning policy 4.2, which is understood to be imminent and with the Minister for finalisation. This is required prior to any further progression of the proposed amendment and would be a vital consideration by the WAPC in this instance due to the lack of reporting and associated non-compliance. Due to the uncapped nature of the future activity centre use, development made possible by the proposed amendment may be considered major development under the draft state planning policy 4.2. As the Oak Street activity centre is relatively undefined and unplanned, the proposed amendment should be considered as out of centre development. Draft state planning policy 4.2 requires a range of additional reporting and supporting documentation, which has not been provided by the applicant in this instance. The proposed amendment will encroach on the industrial precinct without certainty that the remainder of the precinct will change to a mixed use zone in the future. The spot rezoning nature of the proposed amendment sets a dangerous precedent for the piecemeal removal of important industrial land from this precinct over the coming years prior to the finalisation of the planning framework. The encroachment on this industrial land has the potential to create land use conflict in the future by bringing high intensity sensitive land uses such as residential dwellings and high traffic generating uses such as the expanded and revised retail offering into an industrial zone. The applicant states this is not an issue as the surrounding land will not always be industrial. However, as identified previously, this is not certain. This is inconsistent with the objectives of draft state planning policy 4.1, industrial interface. Industrial land within inner city locations is required for the operation of the Perth metropolitan region. The subject site forms a part of a valuable industrial precinct and strategic employment area for the Victoria Park community. Removal of industrial land justified by the demolition of an aging building and replacement with a new development is not valid planning justification or orderly and proper planning. The draft local planning strategy notes the importance of the subject site within the industrial area as an employment area. The contribution of the industrial land and associated businesses to the local economy often far exceeds that of a retail or residential land use and therefore should not be discounted as unimportant. Based on the information I've outlined this evening, the proposed amendment is inappropriate and should not be supported by council. Specifically, both the residential and unspecified retail aspects of the amendment proposal both present issues to this area and the future establishment of an activity centre nearby. These matters have the potential to disrupt the services and amenities that Belmont Forum is able to provide to the Victoria Park residents and the wider community. The intent from the applicant is to revitalize the intent from the applicant to revitalize the site is noted. However, this scheme amendment is not necessary to do that, and the orderly and proper planning processes should still be adhered to. The required and typical planning processes need to be undertaken to determine if removal of this industrial area is a good outcome for the community and the local economy. Circumventing and ignoring these processes sets a dangerous precedent for this area and may compromise existing surrounding businesses. Again, it is noted that there is nothing requiring the applicant to develop in accordance with what they have proposed in the concept plan, and they may choose to develop an entirely different project in the future. It is re requested that Council resolve to not initiate the proposed amendment this evening, 
as it is entirely inconsistent with the established and proposed planning framework and is likely to threaten the current and likely to threaten current and future businesses. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I'm happy to answer any questions that councillors may have. Thank you, Mr. Lewison. Are there any questions from elected members? I'm not seeing any hands going up. Uh, so, Mr. Lewison, on that basis, thank you very much for your time this evening and coming to address council in relation to this matter. Um, we still have another deputation to proceed with. So you're very welcome to remain with us uh, and listen for as long or as short a time as you like. Um, but we will now be proceeding uh, with our last deputee. And so I now invite uh, Mr. Ben Doyle from Planning Solutions on behalf of the applicant niche living uh, to present your deputation to council. We do have 10 minutes. We will endeavour to give you a one minute warning prior to the end of your 10 minutes if you get to that stage. Um, but please simply commence when you are ready. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, excellent. We can. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't expect to speak anywhere near 10 minutes, thank you. Um, I'm speaking in support of the request to initiate a scheme amendment uh, to rezone the Swansea Street Market site um, as just the first step to facilitate the redevelopment of the site, but importantly, the continuation of the markets. Um, and I'll just briefly address um, the objecting uh, deputations that came before me, um, if I may. Um, as you would be aware, councillors, these markets have existed on this site for decades. They are a part of the community there as, as much as anything else in that area. Now, the suggestion that the retention of these markets that have been there for as long as I can remember could somehow undermine the stranglehold of the district shopping centres in Victoria Park and Belmont Forum is quite frankly absurd. It is depressingly familiar to see these major shopping centres dressing up their objections that are clearly about crushing commercial competition under a thin veneer of planning argument. Um, and I would urge you to give them no weight whatsoever. Now that said, um, thank you for taking the time to listen to my colleague's presentation at the agenda briefing uh, and to me tonight and to reading the um, further information that was provided by my colleague, Joshua Carmody. Um, now, unfortunately, as you're aware, the, the town's officers are recommending that the amendment is not initiated tonight as they consider that more planning needs to be done for this precinct. Um, now, can I ask you to please go to attachment 12.1.3 of your agenda, um, which is the additional supporting information that uh, my office provided to the town in March of this year. Um, and if I can ask you to turn to page five of that submission, which has figure two at the top of it, and that's a, a colourful plan um, located at the top of the page. Now, that plan is an overlay that we created which shows 17 years worth of strategic planning that has been done over this area by both the town and the state government. Each one of those coloured lines represents a different strategic plan covering this precinct. You can see that the Swansea Street Market site is right there in the midst of all six of those strategic planning precincts that have been declared over the years, all of which recommend more intensive development of this area. So while the objectors were saying that there's no certainty around the future of this site, I can assure you that there is. This site and this area is going to go to more intensive mixed use development. That's as sure as eggs. But for the last 17 years, the planning for this area has been one of ready, aim, 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 and no pulling of the trigger. So while the desire of the planners, and I'm one of those, to do more planning is understandable, there comes a point where yet more layering of planning documents over the same land really just becomes excessive hesitancy. And when what we really need to do is just get on with it. The councillors, I know that we all understand that not doing something is still an active choice. It's not neutral. And choices have consequences. 
And in this case, what we say is that the consequence of delay is quite likely the total failure of the existing building. And that results in the permanent loss of the Swansea street markets, which would be, I trust you'll agree, a terrible outcome for the community. Once they're gone, it will be well nigh impossible to get back those markets to that site. Now, all we're asking council to do tonight is to start the formal consultation process on the scheme amendment. The town's officers have already carried out the preliminary consultation in accordance with council's consultation policy, and that returned an overwhelmingly supportive result. So I'd hope that that actually gives you the confidence to progress to formal advertising. Otherwise, I'm not sure what the point of that pre preliminary consultation would be. And I'm sure you also will have seen the supportive comments from local MLA, Ms. Hannah Beasley in the local paper after the agenda briefing forum a couple of weeks ago. Now, Ms. Beasley has also mentioned to us specifically that the state government budget last week announced a new key start incentive for Metronet infill precincts, such as this one, that will help young people and others on low incomes to buy a home in a well-serviced urban area, not out on the fringes of the metropolitan area. So what we would say is that the stars are aligned for this site to deliver a revitalized markets and affordable housing at this critical time. But please make no mistake, if we unnecessarily delay, that opportunity may be lost forever. Now, there's a reason that the commercial objectors that you heard from earlier are so keen to see a comprehensive planning process for this area, because they know that the harder the process, the harder it is for competitors to succeed, and the longer it takes, the more profits that they can make while the competition is absent. We're just asking you to start the process tonight by resolving to initiate the scheme amendment for public consultation. Now, we provided some suggested wording for a resolution if councillors wish to support this amendment and get the process started. Um, and if you're supportive, I, I would be very grateful if you would move that alternative motion or some other if you see fit. Thank you very much. I'll be pleased to answer any questions. Thanks, Mr Doyle. Are there any questions from elected members? Uh, Councillor Hendricks. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Vernon. And through yourself, can I ask Ben, and I brought this up last time, and it's a concern I have, is um, if we do change um, or go against the recommendation, um, what guarantee is there that you will actually go ahead and, and put the markets um, it's part of your plan um, because what I'm re reading is that um, if we do change the amendment, that you've got a license to put there anything that you want. So I'm just wondering what the guarantees are um, that you'll go definitely put the market there because that seems central to um, certainly what all the ratepayers look like to see. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doyle, are you able to assist with Councillor Hendricks' question? Uh, yes, certainly, Councillor Hendricks. Um, we would have no objection at all to uh, the town including uh, provisions in that scheme amendment um, to uh, constrain um, the, the uses uh, such that they're appropriate to the site, taking into account the long-standing history of the markets. Um, it is certainly not our intention to facilitate the development of a competitor to Belmont Forum on this site. Um, and so if council, uh, through the scheme amendment process um, wishes to um, modify um, the proposal that we put forward to, uh, to include limitations, we would have no objection to that. Anything further, Councillor Hendricks? No, that's uh, fine, thanks, um, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Um, Mr Doyle, I'll follow that up with a question. Um, what sort of constraints on the site or limitations with regards to use do you consider um, you, would con you would see as appropriate to ensure that the markets remained on the site as opposed uh, to a supermarket? Certainly, Councillor. Um, I'm aware of um, other schemes which specifically define um, supermarkets uh, as against markets or um, other types of shop. Um, SPP 4.2 is introducing um, different restrictions applying to large supermarkets and short, small supermarkets. 
excuse me. Um, so I, I would see that as being um, quite achievable to, to come up with a definition that precludes a, uh, a large supermarket on the site, but still allows the markets to continue. Thank you. Were the scheme amendment to go ahead, what's the most intensive use of the site that your client proposes? In other words, how many residences versus how many retail, commercial shop spaces are you planning? Uh, well, th there's not really a, a specific plan for the number of residences um, at, at this time. Um, it, it's not it's not really the, the stage that we're at in terms of the, the planning for the area and the precinct. Um, but, uh, but certainly that's, if that's information that council wishes to have prior to initiating the scheme amendment, we can, we can certainly flesh that out further. Um, what is the applicant's plan in relation to this site, if the scheme amendment were to go ahead with regards to social housing, what percentage of social housing would your client propose would be included in any development of the site? Again, councillor, or oh, oh, sorry, Mayor, that's that's not, uh, we're at the very early stages of the scheme amendment to set the framework. So um, that's, that's not really a level of detail that has gone into at this stage of the development. Um, following any scheme amendment, once the zoning is in place, um, we would then need to submit a development application and, and that would certainly um, cover off all of those matters. Um, and certainly we're quite happy to continue discussions with the town's offices and, and council as, uh, as any scheme amendment progresses in that regard. Thank you. Can I assume then that your answer to uh, my question what level of affordable housing would you be proposing for any development of the site is the same as the answer to what percentage of social housing you'd be considering? Yes, that, that would be the same answer. That, that level of detail comes quite some way down the track. We're in the, the very early stages. So you would agree that it would be appropriate to investigate the level of social housing and affordable housing needs in the entire precinct prior to you undertaking any development at this site. Would that be right? Uh, no, I, I don't know that it's necessary to go through to, to that extent at this stage. Um, I, I think there's, there's plenty of opportunity for, um, for housing investigations to occur um, by the city, but there's certainly no requirement for them all to be provided on this site. And so on that basis, Mr Doyle, what was the purpose in you referring to the local member of parliament being supportive of your plan or the government having uh, recently in its latest budget uh, endorsed budgetary spend towards affordable housing if it's not relevant to this site and to your client's development of the site? Uh, well, it, it is relevant in that this is certainly likely to be a, a location where that type of housing um, is, is likely to be quite attractive. So um, certainly it's, it's our intention to provide uh, a certain amount of build to rent, um, among other things. So certainly it is our intention to provide um, accommodations that is, that is that is affordable on that site. Well, I guess, Mr Doyle, I'm very keen to understand why, um, what interest and what aspirations developers such as your client are willing to commit to in relation to the advancement of social and affordable housing, um, which is important to people everywhere. A absolutely. And, and again, like with the limitations on the, uh, the types of commercial uses that could be included there, um, if council was to seek to include specific provisions in any scheme amendment uh, requiring certain proportions of certain types of, of housing and accommodations there, we're, we're certainly happy to entertain that also. But I do understand you to say that at this point in time, your client doesn't have any commitment um, to either a percentage or a level of social housing or affordable housing in any development that it might do on the site where the scheme amendment to go ahead. We, we don't have specific numbers um, that I can provide to you as to what's intended because th that level of detail simply hasn't been gone into. Um, but Niche is a huge advocate, is a very strong supporter um, of affordable housing options. They, they are, that, that is a key aspect of their market. Uh, thank you. I understand that um, it's also the case that you've referred to um, 
the risk that if the scheme amendment doesn't proceed, um, that the markets will be lost to this site. Um, isn't it correct that um, a new operator of a market has recently opened, uh, including with a refurbishment of the interior of the site we all call the Swansea Street Market? That, that may well be the case, Mayor. I'm, I'm not uh, specifically aware of a, a new operator, but that may well be the case. The advice I have and, and my understanding of the building is that maintenance of it is uh, becoming increasingly difficult um, due to asbestos, uh, due to the age of the building, due to the nature of the equipment and, uh, and replacement of certain things is simply not possible. So yes, it may well be the case that they've secured a, a tenant um, for one of the, uh, the premises in, in the immediate term. Um, but what we're talking about is several years um, of, of maintenance that would be required. And the advice that I've had from the client is that is uh, unlikely to be achievable. So your client is the landowner and therefore the landlord to all the occupants of the current building. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not specifically aware of the current ownership arrangements. Um, it may well be that they are the owner, um, but there, is, there are contractual arrangements in place. But I, I, don't, I don't specifically know the, uh, the arrangements of, of who owns what and who instructs what and who manages which tenancies. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions from any other elected No, on that basis, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Doyle, for your time, for joining us tonight. We realise that it's somewhat late uh, for the end of a long business day, so we appreciate you taking time to be with us. Um, and that now concludes uh, the deputations portion of our agenda tonight. Um, you are, of course, welcome uh, to remain in the electronic meeting room. Uh, the item does come up at 12.1 for debate in due course. Mayor, if, sorry, if I, if I just may, I've just had a message from my client uh, in response to, if, if it helps, I can answer one of your questions there, uh, confirming that, in fact, uh, Niche is the landowner um, and that the offer to lease of that, uh, those premises that you referred to um, is, is based on a uh, requirement for operating success. Uh, so if, if their operations are not successful in that location, uh, they uh, can uh, permitted to, to depart. And uh, has your client been so kind as to advise you what length of lease that they've given to the new operators who are already up and running? Uh, no, they haven't. But if we can wait for 10 seconds, I suspect they might. I suspect they might too. I'm sorry, Mayor, I, I thank you for your patience. Uh, I haven't had any update yet, so uh, I'm, I'm afraid I can't tell you at this stage. Sorry, uh, here we are, three years. Did, did you catch that, Mayor, three years? Yes, I did. Thank you, thank Mr you. Doyle, I just made a note of that. Thank you, uh, and obviously your client is listening on live streaming, so I appreciate them uh, providing you some further information. Thank you. The wonders of technology. Thanks for your time. Indeed. Thank you again. All right, uh, so elected members will now continue on with the remainder of our council agenda. So the next item on the agenda is item 10, which is the method of dealing with agenda business. The recommendation is that the following items be adopted by exception resolution and the remaining items be dealt with separately. 11.1, Council Resolutions Status Report. 12.2, Request for Amendment to Town Planning Scheme Number 1 to, perm to permit Tavern at 98 to 106 Goodwood Parade, Burswood. 13.2, Edward Millen Adaptive Heritage Redevelopment Project Update. 14.1, Schedule of Accounts, March 2022. And 14.3, Rate Differentials. Can I call please for a mover and a seconder for the recommendation? Moved Councillor Devereaux, seconded Councillor Karimi. Is there any dissent? 
There being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. We'll now move on to item 11, um, which the first item 11.1 has now already been dealt with uh, by exception resolution. Uh, so that will bring us to item 11.2, which is resolutions from the 2022 annual meeting of electors. Now, there's a large number of recommendations to the motions that were passed, and they appear on pages 14 through to 17 of the council's agenda papers. What I am proposing to do is to deal with each of the resolutions in their turn. So rather than deal with them en masse as though they were one set of compendious resolutions, I will deal with them one by one. And I'm doing that in part because we have received notification from uh, at least two elected members that they have alternate motions that they wish to test ahead of the recommended actions by the administration. So um, for those who are following along uh, with their agendas, uh, you'll need to be ready to quickly proceed uh, through those. And we will be starting with uh, the first resolution, um, which is uh, the recommend action is that council one acknowledges the elector's concerns about the monopole tower at 54 Devonish Street and secondly acknowledges that no further action can be taken by the council. So I'm seeking a mover and a seconder. Uh, Councillor Hendricks, you have your hand up. Do you have a question that's procedural in nature? I did have a question on it, but I'm, I'm happy to move it first if you like, so. Um, well, we certainly do need to move each item to get it on the floor before I can take questions about it. So I just want to make sure that your question wasn't a procedural one about the way I propose to deal with them one by one. So thank you. Uh, if you can um, withdraw your electronic hand, that would be appreciated. Uh, I'm calling now for a mover and a seconder for the first resolutions recommended actions. Uh, moved Councillor Hendricks, seconded Councillor Hamer. Is there any dissent? There being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. Oh, so, um, Sorry, Councillor Hendricks. I had a question I was going to ask on that item. Was it? Oh, I'm afraid I've called it, um, so I'm very <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Uh, declared it carried unanimously. It's the quick or the dead around here, uh, Councillor Hendricks. Uh, not that we wish anyone to be dead. Um, so really, if you do have questions, I really do urge you to indicate um, very early in the piece what they are. So we'll now move to um, the second resolution and therefore the recommended action number two. And the recommended action is that council requests the chief executive officer to review the use of the Devonish Lodge site to ensure compliance with the development approval. So can I call please for a mover and a seconder, firstly, for this recommended action. Still seeking a mover. Moved by self Mayor Vernon, seconded Councillor Hamer. Going to call. Is there any dissent? There being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. We're now moving on to the third resolution, 
for which there is a recommended action. However, I wish to move an alternate motion to the officer's recommendation. And uh, the alternate motion is one that I circulated to elected members much earlier today. Uh, and I do hope you've had the opportunity to have a read of it. Um, but uh, I will now outline my alternate. So, my alternate motion is to delete the recommended action for resolution three and insert the following. That council directs the chief executive officer one, whenever requested by any elected member to provide complete copies of all public submissions received in relation to any matter for council's decision to ensure that copies are provided to all elected members. Second, to refer to council any dispute about whether an elected member is entitled to complete copies of all public submissions received in relation to any matter for council's decision. And three, to bring a report to the policy committee by August 2022 for the amendment of policy 023, provision of information and services elected members to include points one and two above. I'm going to outline uh, my reason for moving this alternate motion now. I consider the town's proposed recommended action is unnecessary because the council does not need to note that the CEO will continue to fulfil his statutory obligations. The town's administration is entitled to adopt a practice of summarising the contents of public submissions received during consultation periods within their reports to council, rather than including the public submissions in their entirety. The circumstances in which the town determines to include summaries or full submissions is a matter for them. However, it is always open to any elected member to request complete copies of all public submissions made in relation to any matter relevant to council's decision making. And it is up to each elected member as to whether they feel they need to see full copies if they have not already been provided. I am not aware of any elected member being denied access to such documents upon request by the town, because if they were, they could, in my view, refer that to council for resolution. I consider that this alternate motion will achieve the intent of the elector's motion and further ensure that whenever the town decides to provide summaries of submissions only, if any member requests copies of the full submissions, then all elected members will receive those copies. I consider that it is not for the CEO alone to determine what information is relevant to enable an elected member to make a decision. Council can determine that as well. Putting these matters into policy 023 will ensure that it provides useful guidance and avoids any doubts. I'd like to seek a seconder, please, for my alternate motion. Uh, seconded Councillor Karimi. Um, so uh, my alternate motion is now on the floor. I'm only going to speak very briefly to it. Um, I do feel like there is uh, an understanding on my part that members of our community who don't always see all of the things that happen behind the scenes at council meetings, such as workshops, the exchange of information, the requests that elected members can make for information during the course um, of their week, um, on council. And I understand that sometimes that leads to concerns that full details, especially of public submissions, don't end up being fully available and presented to councillors. Uh, I've no doubt that um, truncating and using extracts or summaries of lengthy public submissions is a convenient mechanism for the administration to present uh, the substance of submissions that are made. I also accept that from time to time, members of the community are um, dissatisfied with the way they believe the town staff have presented their submissions made during the public consultation period. Uh, it is, in my view, uh, entirely uh, a matter of legislative right for elected members to have access to all the information that they need to enable them to make decisions on matters 
come before council. I would hope that no elected member um, feels uncertain about exercising those rights, but I do feel like this alternate, um, instead of the uh, recommendation from the town staff, um, to simply note that the CEO will continue to fulfil his obligations, will actually ensure that if one of us is seeking some submissions, we will all receive them. It's up to all of us whether we read them and how we take account of them. Um, but putting that into policy in the future, I feel will simply be a useful way forward. Um, so that's all I have to say. Councillor Karimi, as a seconder, did you wish to be heard? Uh, no, thank you, Mayor uh, thank you. Uh, I'm actually going to ask, is there any dissent? Um, Councillor Devereaux. Uh, thanks, Mayor Viren. Sorry, I was a little bit slow. I was um, thinking people may want to speak to this and was um, thinking of that before um, the dissent question, um, but I, I did want to um, support the motion. I think transparent information is is very important. Um, but as you also pointed out, um, there hasn't been any occasion that I'm aware of either where people have um, been seeking information they haven't received. And I just would like to add that I think um, it does um, assist the helpful work of the council when we have um, the useful summaries that we get of the volu voluminous um, information that is required to um, collect for these sorts of matters. So I did want to also just um, highlight that fact while I also support the opportunity for seeking more information when it's useful. Um, I also um, value the fact that we get um, summaries and assume that will continue to be the, the common practice and only when we need extra information might we uh, seek it out um, to help our decision making. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Devereaux. Um, so I will formally ask, is there any dissent? There being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. We now move to uh, resolution four and the recommended action that goes with resolution four. And again, I would like to put forward an alternate motion um, to test in advance of the officer's recommendation. Just bear with me for one second while I bring up uh, that alternate motion, uh, which has also been shared with elected members earlier today. Uh, so, uh, my alternate motion is to delete the recommended action for resolution four and insert the following. That council one adopts the joint statement of principles to support proactive disclosure of government held information developed by all Australian information commissioners and ombudsmen and released on 24 September 2021, which is a joint statement of principles. Secondly, publishes the Council's adoption of the Joint Statement of Principles on the Town's website. And three, requests the Chief Executive Officer to develop a policy to incorporate and give effect to the Joint Statement of Principles to be presented to the Policy Committee for consideration by the end of 2022. Now outline uh, my reason for this alternate. Policy 001 guides the development of policies for the town. It requires a process that goes through the policy committee and allows time to consider all the implications and obligations that may need to be included in the policy in order to embed behaviour change into the organisation and ensure it's workable in practice. Prior to developing a policy based on the joint statement of principles, council should adopt the joint statement of principles. This alternate motion will ensure we follow our own policy on policy development through the policy committee. I consider that the proposed referral to the policy committee by the end of this calendar year should allow sufficient time for development of a draft policy. And in the meantime, the adoption of the joint statement principles can begin to guide the town's practice in this area. Can I seek a seconder please for my alternate?
seconded Councillor Karimi. Uh, I don't wish to be heard any further. Councillor Karimi, did you wish to be heard? Uh, no, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Um, is there any dissent? No, I'm not seeing any dissent. So there being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for supporting that alternate motion. Uh, we'll now go to the next of the resolutions, which is resolution number five um, and recommended action accordingly. So the recommended action is that council notes the chief executive officer will continue managing and maintaining non-Western power decorative streetlights within the peninsula stage 2A area in Burswood to the extent that it is legally bound to do so. Can I call please for a mover and a seconder of the officer's recommended action for resolution five? Still seeking a mover. Still seeking a mover. Moved Deputy Mayor Anderson, seconded Councillor Devereaux. Deputy Mayor Anderson, do you wish to be heard? No, oh, thank you. Councillor Devereaux is the seconder. Do you wish to be heard? Uh, no, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Is there any dissent? There being no dissent indicated, declare that carried unanimously. Now move to resolution six and the recommended action. Understand, Councillor Hamer, you have a alternate motion that you wish to test ahead of the officer's recommended action. Yes, I do. And I'll read that out now. Uh, that council acknowledges the elector's request for the town of Victoria Park to advocate for the further removal of the remaining COVID-19 vaccination mandates. Number two, adopts an advocacy position statement known as the COVID-19 vaccination pro-choice statement. Number three, adds new advocacy priority COVID-19 vaccination pro-choice statement to the advocacy program. Number four, notes an additional $10,000 be added to the advocacy budget for 22-23 for this priority. And my reason, this is closer to the intent of the electors from the annual meeting of electors. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hamer. Um, do I have a seconder for Councillor Hamer's alternate motion, please? Seconded Councillor Hendricks. Councillor Hamer, do you wish to speak to your alternate motion? Yeah, just briefly if I can. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Uh, being aware that Council decided not to contact the Premier in regards to community concerns around mandates at the start of the year, um, since then we have had the opportunity to hear more from the community at the annual meeting of electors and see what other local governments such as Port Hedland, Mundaring, Busselton, Wanneroo, Esperance, and many others have done in support of these concerns. While many welcome the announcement by the state government last month to drop the requirement to show vaccination status at point of entry, the requirement on employers and employee still, employees still remains. This is a barrier to many businesses that are struggling to find staff and allow, that, allow those that didn't get vaccinated or that have decided not to get a booster to rejoin the workforce. So on that premise, I'm looking to advocate, ask council to advocate for the further removal of um, restrictions. Thanks, Councillor Hamer. Councillor Hendricks is the seconder. Do you wish to speak? Uh, yes, I can, Mayor Vernon. Do you want? I've got quite a bit. Do I do that now or later on? Uh, 
It is your only opportunity to speak now, Councillor Hendricks. Okay. Seconder, I'll... and um, under our meeting procedures, local law, there is an indication elected members shouldn't speak for longer than five minutes unless there's agreement by council to extend that time. But five minutes is quite a long time to speak. So okay. if you've got things to say, um, please proceed. I'll, I'll do the best I can. Um, so, yes, I'm fully supportive of, of this motion because, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, in February 2021, Greg Hunt, the Australian um, Health Minister, announced on the ABC News that the world is engaged in the largest clinical trial, the largest global vaccination trial ever, and we will have enormous amounts of data. The fact that the vaccination is also an experiment is confirmed by a statement on the Pfizer COVID-19 Community Patient Information Leaflet, and it states, the study does not end until 2023. People who take the vaccine should be aware that it is still essentially an experiment. Being coerced into taking experimental um, medical substance goes against the Nuremberg Code and is a violation of human rights. We should not be forced to take the vaccine for which we, um, for which the long-term effects are not known. So why are the unvaccinated being subjected to mandates or why is anyone being subjected to the mandates? We should have the right to choose and be given proper informed consent when it comes to COVID vaccines. Another point, natural immunity is far, far more robust than, and longer lasting um, than being vaccinated. There's at least 81 um, peer reviewed studies which back this up. The mandates and restrictions are the main reason our, our community has been suffering. Um, as we heard earlier, it divides the community. And in our strategic plan, uh, it actually, uh, in, in the, one of the vision statements, it says we are inclusive, and connected with a thriving community. So the mandates are actually preventing that from happening. Um, a scientific study which shows that masks are effective, uh, conveniently ran the test from the start of the pandemic in March 2020 to October 2020. Cases skyrocketed in the following months and if the study had, uh, was run through to February, it would have shown convincingly that masks do not work. Wearing face masks has been demonstrated to have substantial adverse physiological and psychological effects. These include hypoxia, shortness of breath, increased acidity and toxicity, activation of fear and stress. Response, rise in uh, stress hormones, immunosuppression, fatigue, headaches, declining co cognitive performance, predisposition for viral and infectious illnesses, chronic stress, anxiety and depression, long-term consequences of wearing face masks can cause health deterioration, developing and progression of chronic diseases and premature death. Mask mandates should stop. And that was also mentioned as being a, um, a detriment to running businesses in the local, in, in, uh, in, in the talks we heard earlier. Vaccines don't work. They wane quickly, they are ineffective, to variants such as Omicron and Delta. This can be evidenced by the increase in cases we are now seeing. And Anthony Fauci has even said, Omicron will find just about everybody, including the vaccinated, and maybe a lot of them will get infected. Recent data from Public Health Scotland and UK government shows that people who have had two doses uh, of the vaccine get infected at far greater rates than those that are unvaccinated. Then of course is the injuries to the latest um, um, I mean, there is a side effects of the vaccines and, and they certainly far, far um, are worse than, than the benefit of, of uh, taking the vaccine. So- Councillor Hendricks, you have one and a half minutes left. The radio. Um, I mean, even tonight we heard how pericarditis is affecting, um, or, or could have been myocarditis, or the heart thing is affecting people. Um, just recently, um, well, on, on the adverse uh, uh, reporting system, America has this over a million, uh, sorry, 1,000, 27,000 deaths and, 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 a, and a, over a million ad, severe adverse reactions. Um, but just in ending, I'd like to, to mention that um, while we're in, in this pre-election period, we're probably in a lull and we've seen a relaxation of the, um, of the mandates. 
our big concern or big concern is that once uh, the elections are over, we're going to return back to the um, uh, the way things were before. Um, and this is what happened with, in France with, with Macron, where, where the vaccination passport has been brought back into effect. Um, and I think that's another reason we should uh, support um, uh, this particular amendment, um, because um, it, it's we just don't. I, I think people that, that should be given the choice um, whether to get this uh, vaccine or not. Um, and, and also, particularly, we're also the closest um, form of government to the people we represent. Um, and, and coming from uh, advocating from the council is far, far more powerful than doing it individually. So I urge my fellow um, electors to um, support this amendment or motion. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Hendricks. Um, I do wish to ask um, a couple of questions of Councillor Hamer um, before we move on. Uh, my first question, Councillor Hamer, is in relation to your amendment, which sadly I'm having a little trouble seeing very clearly, so I'm trying to find it as an email instead. Um, Aha, right. uh -huh. all right. I might be able to see this uh, a bit better. The curse of my failing eyesight. Um, so, Councillor Hamer, you say in paragraph two of your alternate to adopt an advocacy position statement known as the COVID-19 vaccination pro-choice statement. Um, I feel that it would be remiss of me not to ask you the question, what exactly is that? How can council entertain passing a resolution when we have no idea what it is that we would be agreeing to? Thank you, Mayor Vernon. I, I probably should have outlined that more clearly. I'm pretty sure the wording of that is mentioned in the original motion from the annual meeting of electors, if I can find it. Um, I'm gonna to have to go back to the previous meeting. Um, I would ask you to give con some consideration to my question about how we would go forward um, with the statement as it currently appears. And then my second question is, why have you suggested that we allocate $10,000 worth of um, budgetary expenditure for this advocacy when that wasn't requested by the elector's motion? Uh, that was the recommendation from governance when I put this draft motion to them. Uh, they also suggested, uh, made me aware that there is currently five advocacy positions and was I asking to remove one or add a sixth position and I've chosen to add a sixth position and the dollar amount of $10,000 was from governance, not from myself. So did you ask any questions about what $10,000 is for? Uh, no, that might be operational. I'm not sure how they would advocate or what they would entail or what budget. I mean, I was told a a survey cost 15,000, so I'm not expecting um, much to happen with 10,000. All right, uh, thank you. Um, that's all the questions that I had. Um, I will actually ask, are there any other elected members who have any questions about the alternate motion? Councillor Devereaux? Uh, thanks, Mayor Vernon. It's not so much a question, but just a clarification. I think the detail about uh, what is the pro-choice statement is part of Resolution 6, which is on um, the, the page with the resolutions um, in the agenda. And it goes from um, A, I think, to H, um, the different uh, content that it refers to. 
Uh, thanks, Councillor Devereaux. Um, elected members need to speak either for or against a matter or ask questions, um, as opposed to giving clarification, unless you are the person from whom the questions have been asked. So thank you for your contribution, but as I say, um, elected members' roles are quite defined in the meeting procedures local law. Councillor I, if you have a question. I do, thank you, Mevin. And I have a question for Councillor Hainer. Um, if the intent is to take the vaccination pro-choice statement directly from the wording of Resolution 6, then I'm afraid it's really quite unclear because Resolution 6 was unclear itself on the night of the special electors meeting. And I'm interested to hear from Councillor Hamer um, what his views are on the current wording of Resolution 6. Thank you. The current wording of the statement, of the pro-choice statement? Yes, um, you'll see that it, it says, Adopt an advocacy position statement called the COVID-19 vaccination pro-choice statement with the content, A, prevented from performing work or receiving income on the basis of. Um, there is no, it doesn't actually make sense in any context. If you read it this way, it's, it's actually unclear if it is supporting mandates or not supporting mandates. It reads clearly to me, um, yeah, I'm not sure that, I mean, it seems straightforward to me from all the way to H, yeah. All right, thanks, Councillor Hamer. Um, so we've had two speakers in favour. Is there anyone who wishes to speak against? I will speak uh, against the alternate motion. Um, Councillor Hamer, uh, thank you for bringing your alternate motion to our attention. I think for me, when I consider resolution six, um, I keep coming back um, to the position which I feel will undoubtedly disappoint um, some of those who are listening. But I do not consider that it is the role of council to adopt a COVID-19 vaccination pro-choice statement for the town, which has been drafted by an elector to support their political or moral opposition to decisions made by the WA government and endorsed by 15 other electors of the town at an annual electors meeting. To do so, in my view, would be to prefer the personal views of a small group of residents in the town over a significantly larger majority who have neither expressed their views on the subject publicly or explicitly, nor requested this council to take such a position on their behalf. It is appropriate for individuals to express their own personal views about uh, how they feel about WA government legislation, and its policies and what impact it may have had on their life to those persons who have been elected by due process to represent them in the WA Parliament where those decisions were made. Council, in my view, should develop its advocacy positions in accordance with the town's advocacy policy and in alignment with its endorsed annual advocacy priorities because they're developed through council having regard to the strategic community plan's mission and strategic outcomes. I don't in the circumstances consider the fact that the strategic community plan has uh, visions for us to be an inclusive uh, and connected community or that the town has corporate values uh, that include us caring for the people in the organisation and caring for the people in our community extends to council taking a position that is in my view beyond its role under the Local Government Act, which is for the good government of the town, meaning we govern the town and we make the laws that apply within the town to a degree that is separate to other laws that are imposed by the state and federal government in respect of which we simply follow those laws. And finally, council's role as oversight of the town's performance of its function. So I can't get past that. I've given this a great deal of thought. Um, I listened very um, carefully 
to comments made by Mr and Mrs Vandermay and Ms Holdsworth where we had a meeting last week. I'm grateful to them for their insight. I've heard from plenty of people within the community, plenty of whom have a firm view that it isn't the role of their local council to be undertaking any type of advocacy in this area because to do so would be to purport to speak on behalf of a large portion of the community who have not expressed a desire for me or every other member of this council to do so on their behalf. So unfortunately, my position is that I can't support this alternate motion. Thank you. Is there anyone who would wish now to speak in favour of the alternate motion? So we're following our meeting procedures, local law now. If there's no one who wishes to speak in favour, is there anyone else who wishes to speak against? Councillor Ayn. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. I will be brief. I could say a lot, but um, there's really no point getting into a debate about science tonight. Um, I'm not planning to support this alternate um, for very similar reasons to yours. Um, quite simply that us spending $10,000 on advocacy for something that the majority of our community has not expressed a concern about does not seem like good government to me. Our community, when I speak to them, tell me that what they want us to be doing is our jobs, making our good decisions about our community, making good decisions about our town. Um, and I think that this issue was one that caused significant concern among a small number of our community for a while. Um, and much of that concern has diminished recently with um, some of those mandates being lifted. Um, and I'm just not hearing the interest from our community broadly for us to continue to pursue anything along these lines. Um, I, don't, I still don't believe it's our job. I don't believe that it's an appropriate advocacy position for us to take. And I don't believe that it's appropriate for us to spend $10,000 on this. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor I. Uh, is there any other elected member who wishes to speak on this item before I call for the mover of the motion to close the debate? Councillor Devereux. Uh, thanks, Mayor Vernon. I just um, wanted to briefly say, um, I think this issue is a polarising one in our community. And I feel um, the role of the council is to support all electors and hear all electors. Um, and I feel like COVID has been a significant imposition on the whole of our community. And I think uh, important, it has been important and is important for the council to continue to support our community as a whole and recognise the impact of COVID on the whole community and seek to um, support the whole community in uh, surviving COVID and uh, thriving and being a vibrant, supportive community for all um, as a diverse community. Um, but I also do want uh, all of our community to feel heard and feel that's important. I don't um, support this motion because I don't feel like it does take that broad approach of supporting all people um, to cope with the imposition that uh, COVID has made for all of us. Um, but I do um, support the view that people should be heard and was appreciative of those at the um, electors meeting that raised it so that we could hear it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Devereux. Is there anyone, any other elected member who hasn't been heard, um, who wishes to be heard? If not, then I'll go to Councillor Hamer as the mover to close the debate. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Um, yes, it is a small percentage of people who are, remain unvaccinated or not um, boosted, but there is a percentage of businesses who are working and trying to employ people who are also suffering from the remaining restrictions. And the $10,000 is a small amount of money. The town didn't seem to have any problem spending 100 and whatever thousand on concierge services at the start of the year for uh, a few of the facilities. But I understand that some people think this is political, but I don't think it's political. I think it's just a simple matter of right and wrong. And I... Um, Appreciate everyone's got their own views. So thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hamer. So elected members, if you could now please vote using your electronic voting buttons.
So declare the alternate motion lost. Uh, those in favour were Councillor Hamer and Councillor Hendricks. Those against, myself, Mayor Vernon, Deputy Mayor Anderson, Councillor Ife, Councillor Devereaux and Councillor Corini. Thank you. Uh, so we'll now move on to the next of the recommendations, which is recommendation number, well, recommended action number seven for resolution seven. The recommendation, recommended action is that Council One acknowledges the request for Council to obtain the full modelling report and evidence related to the COVID-19 state of emergency and two, does not make the request as any person that wishes to obtain copies of the document can do so by making a request to the relevant government agency. Uh, can I call please for a mover and a seconder for that recommendation? Moved Councillor Karimi, seconded Councillor Hamer. Councillor Karimi, as the mover, did you wish to be heard? No, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Uh, Councillor Hamer, as the seconder, did you wish to be heard? No, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Is there any dissent? There being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we. Uh, sorry. Oh, of course. Um, yes, uh, it has been pointed out to me that we do actually need to go back to recommendation number six because the alternate motion was lost. So my fault, uh, probably just trying to get moving. Um, we'll go back and deal with recommendation number six, um, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the time because we've already been sitting for longer than two hours and normally I would have moved for a break uh, at the 8.30 mark. So um, we'll see if we can endeavour to get this issue rectified and my apologies to elected members for making that one resolution too far forward. So uh, we end up with uh, resolution number six, the recommendation. Recommended action is that Council 1 acknowledges the request for the Town of Victoria Park to advocate for the removal of the COVID-19 vaccination mandates and adopt an advocacy position statement called the COVID-19 vaccination pro-choice statement. And two, does not add the requested advocacy to its advocacy priorities. Can I call please for a mover and a seconder for the recommended action, please? Uh, moved Councillor Ife, seconded Councillor Karimi. Councillor Ife, did you wish to be heard? Uh, no, thank you. It's all been discussed already. Uh, thank you. Councillor Karimi, did you wish to be heard? No, thank you. Thank you. Is there any dissent? Councillor Hamer. Um, yes, thank you, Ms. Vernon. I'd just like to vote against it, that's all. All right, there was nothing further that you wish to add to um, what you said previously? No, nothing further, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in accordance with our meeting procedures, local law, is there anyone who would now wish to speak for the officer's recommendation? Is there anyone who'd like to speak against? Councillor Hendricks. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Um, I've said pretty well what I want to say previously, but I do want to reiterate the fact that these are experimental vaccines. We do not know the long-term effect, and I think we should uh, there should be choice as to if we take them or not, and not be coerced into them, um, like or have, having to take them to get a job. I think is, is illegal and it's wrong. Um, so I'm for that reason voting against this one. So thanks, Councillor Hendricks. Um, 
I will now go back to Councillor Eif um, as the mover. Do you wish to close the debate? Uh, look, no, there's no need to close the debate. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll now have everyone please vote using your electronic voting buttons. Uh, declare the uh, recommended action for resolution six um, is carried. Those in favour, myself, Mayor Vernon, Deputy Mayor Anderson, Councillor Eif, Councillor Devereaux and Councillor Creamy. Those against, Councillor Hamer and Councillor Hendricks. Thank you. Now, elected members, with your indulgence, we now have, I think, only two of the individual recommendations left for this item. Um, if you can just give me an indication um, by nodding your head or the like, um, are you happy to continue to go through those last two remaining matters? And then I'll move that we have a short break. Thank you uh, for your nodding of assent. Uh, so now we go forward to, uh, and someone will definitely correct me if I am wrong, to recommendation number eight, or resolution eight and the recommended action for uh, resolution eight. That recommended action is that Council 1 acknowledges the request for Council to advocate for the removal of mask requirements, density and capacity limits, proof of vaccination requirements and vaccine mandates in relation to COVID-19. Two, does not add the requested advocacy to its advocacy priorities. And three, continues to support local business through the town's economic development and place programs. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, for the recommended action? Moved Councillor Karimi. Um, oh, we haven't yet got a seconder, is that right? Oh, no. Uh, seconded Councillor Hamer. Councillor Karimi, did you wish to be heard? No, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Councillor Hamer, did you wish to be heard? Just briefly, thank you, Mayor Vernon. I was going to try a alternative, but on hearing uh, the support, I won't waste your time. I will just vote against the point two of the uh, not requesting the advocacy to this priority. All right, thank you. Is there anyone who wishes now to speak in favour of the recommendation? Anyone else who wishes to speak against? Uh, Councillor Karimi, as the mover of the recommended action, do you wish to be heard to close the debate? Uh, Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Just to say that given that where we are sitting in WA at the moment with regards to mask requirements and uh, density and capacity limits and so on, and uh, looking at the case numbers and everything that's going on, I think um, this is uh, best served by the Chief Health Officer and the people in the know. So I'm comfortable to support this uh, recommendation as it stands. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Karimi. If I could just now invite elected members to please vote um, for the recommended action or against it. I declare the recommended action is carried. Those in favour, myself, Mayor Vernon, Deputy Mayor Anderson, Councillor Ive, Councillor Devereaux and Councillor Karimi. Those against, Councillor Hamer and Councillor Hendricks. Thank you. Uh, that does bring us to the last of the resolutions, which is resolution number nine and the recommended uh, council action for resolution number nine is that Council 1 acknowledges the electors' request to develop an Acknowledgement and Reconciliation Action Program, ARAP, support experiences affected by vaccines and request funding from the State Government to pay for development of the ARAP. Two, does not request the Chief Executive Officer to develop an ARAP. Three, does not request funding from the State Government to pay for the development of the ARAP. Four, requests the Chief Executive Officer to support the community by continuing with the development and implementation of already identified social plans 
to address social cohesion, social isolation, and bring together community around shared interests and goals. Five, request the CEO to support the community by continuing the implementation of services and projects that address social cohesion and aim to improve the wellbeing of our entire community. And six, request the CEO to continue to proactively explore grant and funding opportunities that the town is eligible for to enhance social cohesion and wellbeing. Can I have please a mover and a seconder for that recommended action? Uh, moved Councillor Karimi, seconded Councillor Hamer. Councillor Karimi, do you wish to be heard? No, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Councillor Hamer is the seconder. Do you wish to be heard? No, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Is there any dissent? Councillor Hamer. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Yes, I did support this idea or looking into it or looking at the funding. Um, so I'll vote against this recommendation. All right, thank you. Is there any elected member who wishes to speak for? Any other elected member who wishes to speak against? And no, in that case, I'll go back to the mover of the motion, Councillor Karimi, to close the debate. Do you wish to be heard? Thanks, Councillor Karimi. Um, on that basis, elected members, if you could now please vote. Uh, declare that carried. Um, those in favour, myself, Mayor Vernon, Deputy Mayor Anderson, Councillor Hendricks, Councillor Ife, Councillor Devereaux and Councillor Karimi and those against, Councillor Hamer. Thank you. So that concludes item 11.2. And so we've now reached 8.50pm. So elected members, uh, I would like to um, propose um, a brief procedural motion that we adjourn for 10 minutes, um, commencing at 8.50 p.m. Can I have a seconder, please, for that procedural motion? Uh, seconded, Councillor Creamy. Is there any dissent? No, there being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. We will see you back at nine o'clock. Please turn your cameras off and ensure that your audio um, microphones are also switched off. And we'll see you all shortly.
uh, councillors. Um, it's now 9.02 p.m. Uh, and hopefully we have everyone back. I think we're just waiting for Deputy Mayor Anderson and Councillor Hamer. Deputy Mayor Anderson and Councillor Hamer. So uh, thank you all for rejoining us uh, and to those who are still in the meeting room with us and to those who have joined us on live streaming. It does pain me uh, to say what I have to say next, and that is to advise people listening that a member of our community named Vincent Maxwell during the last session was text trolling my mobile phone, sending me messages, including calling me names with regards to statements that I made in relation to the last item. I consider the behaviour of Mr Maxwell to be bullying and to be completely unacceptable. If I was sitting in the council chamber and he also was a member of the public gallery, I would not tolerate such behaviour from him or any other person. It's unacceptable. It won't be accepted by me now. It won't be accepted by me at any time. And Mr Maxwell, frankly, your views are completely inappropriate and you need to learn some manners. And so next time you come into the council chamber, expect that I will be severe upon any transgression of the meeting procedures local law that you make because you do it all the time and you're texting me during the middle of this meeting when I'm trying to preside over the meeting, not least of which trying to speak and say my own personal opinion is completely inappropriate and is a breach of the meeting procedures local law were you actually in the room. So I don't consider this behaviour to be at all appropriate and I'd like people in our community to actually hear what some people get up to. Councillors don't deserve this. No elected member deserves to be treated like that for simply saying their piece in a respectful way. Thank you. So now we'll move on with the remainder of our agenda. Uh, so we now move on to the next item, uh, which is uh, coming up as 11.3 Annual Review of Delegations. This is an absolute majority item. The recommendation is as follows, that Council 1 reviews its delegations to the Chief Executive Officer and other employees as detailed in the attachment in accordance with Section 5.46, Subsection 2 of the Local Government Act 1995, and 2 adopts the amended delegations of authority to the Chief Executive Officer as detailed in the attachment to come into effect on 1 July 2022 in accordance with Section 5.42, Subsection 1, of the Local Government Act 1995. Can I call please for a mover and a seconder for the recommendation? Still seeking a seconder. Uh, moved myself, Mayor Vernon, seconded Councillor Karimi. I don't wish to be heard. Councillor Karimi, do you wish to be heard? No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Is there any dissent to this item? No, there being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the next item is 11.4 which is uh, sponsorship funding for 2022-2023. The recommendation is, oops, I've shot the mark, that council endorse the following sponsorship funding applications. One, Movies by Burswood Inc, trading as Telethon Community Cinemas, $17,500. Two, John Curtin Gallery, Curtin University, $10,900. And three, West Cycle Incorporated, $10,000. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, for the recommendation? Moved Councillor Devereaux, seconded Councillor Karimi. Councillor Devereaux, did you wish to be heard? 
I just very briefly, Mayor Vernon, um, to say I think these um, recommendations are for um, initiatives that are all very positive and um, we had a good discussion around some of the um, details of them at the agenda briefing um, session as well. So uh, on that basis, I was happy to move it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Karimi as the seconder, do you wish to be heard? Oh, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Uh, now, I was given an indication that there might be some questions from elected members. Is there any elected member who does have some questions about this item? Councillor Hendricks. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Um, I'd just like to ask a question um, about this one. It's to do with one of the unsuccessful um, applicants. Um, I note that one of the reasons that conscious living co-creations were unsuccessful in the grant was because the town sees them as an organisation which is tied to anti-vaccination. If this factor was taken out of the equation, would they have been successful in the grant application? Thank you, Councillor Hendricks. Um, I'm going to refer your questions, please, to our Manager of Stakeholder Relations, Ms Ellis. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering that question because it would need to go back through the panel. Um, yeah. Seems like Councillor Hendricks, we can't necessarily advance an answer to that question for you. Is there anything else that you wanted to ask? No, I, was, I, actually, I did ask this question earlier through governance, but it never got a response either. Um, I, I, I would just be concerned if, if that was the reason for them getting knocked back. Um, but anyway, I, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, well, obviously, Councillor Hendricks, there being um, a, the establishment of a panel, which Council approved when it adopted the policy for um, community funding. Um, and clearly, Ms Ellis has indicated that decisions about whether or not a particular applicant might in the future or in another um, iteration of a funding round could be successful would very much depend on what the panel as constituted at the time um, considered was appropriate, um, having perhaps regard to some directions that it might have um, in any sponsorship application package. So um, I think that might be as far as we can take an answer to your question. Um, so I will now put this matter. Is there any dissent? There being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is we now move to uh, item 12, which is the Chief Community Planner reports. And our first item is 12.1, request for amendment to town planning scheme number one to rezone land at numbers 176 and 178 lots 20 and 21 Swansea Street East, East Victoria Park. The recommendation is that council resolves pursuant to section 75 of the Planning and Development Act 2005 to not initiate an amendment to the Town of Victoria Park Planning Scheme number one to rezone the land at numbers 176 and 178 lots 20 and 21 Swansea Street East, East Victoria Park from industrial one zone to commercial R-AC3 for the reasons outlined in the officer's report, most notably that rezoning of the land at this time would be inconsistent with actions OS.1, OS.3 and OS.4 of the town's draft local planning strategy and that the rezoning of the land in advance of actions OS.1 and OS.3 is ad hoc, premature and would prejudice both the precinct planning work to be undertaken by the town and the future development of land in the locality. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, for the officer's recommendation? Still seeking a mover. Moved Councillor Devereaux, seconded Councillor Hamer. Councillor Devereaux, did you wish to be heard? 
Uh, just very briefly, uh, Mayor Vernon, um, we've heard a number of different um, positions on this, and we also um, heard at the agenda briefing um, for about this. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things about this um, opportunity, but I think as well, uh, as is, is well documented in the officer's um, report, um, there is a, a solid um, evidence and, and reasoning for why it's good to do um, the work as a whole rather than in an ad hoc, ad hoc manner. And I feel like um, as much as um, the market is a, is a, a, a much loved a part of the town and we would all um, hope that it is retained in the future, um, we can't preempt um, the possibility of that um, by um, without yeah, taking into consideration the, the longer term uh, plans for the whole area, uh, particularly given what's happening um, with the train line. So uh, I uh, yeah, support the officer's recommendation on that basis. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Devereux. Councillor Hamer, as the seconder of the motion, do you wish to be heard? Thank you, Mayor Vernon. I've actually struggled with this one. I think I'm still on the fence. Uh, reading the officer's recommendation and then reading the emails from Planning Solutions, does sound a little bit different that they're just asking for the town to advertise the amendment and then make further submissions. Um, seeing the submissions from the public and the, the weighted uh, positivity of that. Um, and yeah, I'm, it's a tough one, um, but I don't think that area would be anything else apart from what it is. So, I'm not a planner, so I can't really sort of comment on that. And I wasn't given much information with the questions I asked from governments. governments. Uh, so, Councillor Hamer, I'm sorry to have to ask this, but were you speaking for or against um, the matter? I feel I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Um, so is there anyone who wishes to speak against the officer's recommendation? Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Well, if there's no one who wishes to speak against the officer's recommendation, then I'll simply put the matter. Um, but I'm mindful of the fact that, Councillor Hamer, you didn't actually indicate to me whether you were against or for it. And so I'm on that basis, I'm not going to call and say, is there any dissent? Because that might um, resolve your position for you without it, you even realising it. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak in favour um, of the matter? Look, I, um, Councillor Hendricks. Yes, thank you, Mayor Vernon. I'm, I'm also a bit like Councillor Hamer on the fence, but the fact that when I asked the question last week, how long are all this pre, uh, precinct planning going to take? And it seems to me it's only three years um, that they should be able to go ahead with this thing. Um, and I think in the scheme of things, three years is not uh, that big a wait. Um, and, and for that reason, I think it's proper sense to do the, the, the proper planning and, um, and I'd be voting for the recommendation. Uh, thanks, Councillor Hendricks. Um, I was about to briefly speak on the matter, um, but I was quite happy for you to go first. Um, I will support the officer's recommendation. Although we heard, uh, particularly this evening, um, suggestions that there's been uh, almost two decades worth of planning in this area, what is important to me is that in recent years, there have been increasing obligations placed on local government through amendments to planning legislation, requiring us to develop a local planning strategy, requiring us to think uh, about things such as Perth and Peel at 3.5 million, the latest government expectations for the amount of infill development to meet population growth that's expected for our area. And if the last couple of years in particular have taught us anything, is that things have changed and things are changing with the way people live their lives and with what people want to achieve and how they want to achieve it and what they want from their community. 
So those things say to me that time spent in good planning uh, will pay off ultimately. And it is the recommendation of the town staff um, who themselves are expert planners, and I'm not one, um, that what is required here is not spot rezoning, is not ad hoc approaches to planning, but a coordinated and systematic approach to how we plan for the future of what is a precinct that we would all like to see have some love in the future, have some appreciable improvement in the amenity and the way it looks. It is ideally located within proximity to major roadways such as Welshpool Road, Oak Street, Albany Highway, Shepparton Road, as well as being close to a major train line in the Armadale rail line. And all of those things will no doubt be part of the information that the town will collect uh, as it plans the future of this precinct. And noting that uh, the current landowner of the property indicated that they did have desires to see a mix of mixed use of residential as well as commercial, I feel that taking the steps to find out where the need lies within the community and do some proper planning around that um, should produce the optimal outcome uh, for our community as a whole. So I will support the officer's recommendation and encourage my fellow elected members to do the same. Is there any other elected member who wishes to be heard on this matter? If there isn't, I'm now gonna call for elected members to please vote. Uh, declare that matter carried. Um, those in favour, myself, Mayor Vernon, Deputy Mayor Anderson, Councillor Devereaux, Councillor Karimi, Councillor Ife and Councillor Hendricks. Those against, Councillor Hamer. Thank you. Now move on to item 12.2, request for amendment to town planning scheme number one to commit tavern at... 98 to 106 Goodwood Parade, Burswood. Uh, the recommendation for this matter appears at the Ordinary Council meeting's agenda on pages 50 through to 51. It is a lengthy recommendation. I won't read it all. The recommendation is that Council 1 resolves pursuant to Section 75 of the Planning and Development Act 2005 to initiate an amendment, amendment number 91 to the Town of Victoria Park Planning Scheme number 1 to A, amend Schedule C, additional uses of the scheme text by listing a tavern as an additional use for numbers 98 to 106 Goodwood Parade, Burswood, in the following terms that appear on pages 15 to 51 of the agenda. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, for the officer's recommendation? Uh, Councillor Ife, did you have a question? I do. Sorry, Mayor Vernon. My notes say that we dealt with this as an exception resolution item. Am I... Going around uh, the. Uh, I hope that we didn't, because that would mean the mayor's agenda didn't have that in it. Um, right, I'm going back to the beginning. No. Um, oh, yes, request for 12.2 is part of the exception resolution. So. Um, Ms. Brianovich, is that correct? We've already dealt with that? Uh, yes, Mayor Vernon, that is correct. We have dealt with that. Okay. My apologies, elected members. The Mayor's agenda uh, indicated that that matter was still a matter for dealing with, and it's obviously getting late in the evening. Uh, so we'll now move on to item 12.3, vehicular access policy. The recommendation is that Council 1 adopts the amended version of draft local planning policy number 42, vehicular access for residential development as contained at attachment six in accordance with clause four, subsection three of the Dean provisions of the planning development local planning schemes regulation 2015 and two, request the chief executive officer to arrange for publication of notice of the adoption of local planning policy 42, vehicular access for residential development in accordance with Dean Clause 87 of the Planning and Development Local Planning Schemes Regulations 2015. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, for the recommendation? Uh, 
Still seeking a mover. Still seeking a mover. Uh, moved Councillor Hendricks, seconded Councillor Karimi. Councillor Hendricks, as the mover, did you wish to be heard? Yes, thank you, Mayor Vernon. Actually, I have an, a, an amendment to this motion, so can I make that now? Or do we... Yes, you can move that now, please. If you could read out your amendment uh, and then tell us your reason, please, before I call for a seconder. Okay, so my amendment to the motion is that the following wording be added at the end of point one of the officer's recommendation. With the following changes made to clause two, bracket C of the draft um, local uh, LPP 42. Uh, so there's two, two points there. So after in brackets district distributor A and B, close bracket, add the words where driveways are required to be designed for two-way access to allow for vehicles to enter the street in forward gear. And the other change is after Basinghall Street, in the list of roads add uh, in brackets Portion Albany Highway to Buick Street. Uh, thanks, Councillor Hendricks. Did you give us your reason, please, for moving this amendment? Yep. So the reason, uh, Clause 5, makes mention of when vehicles are required to enter the street in forward gear, but nowhere in the draft policy does it make mention of when vehicles are to do this. So making this amendment makes it uh, makes the policy uh, clearer to understand. And uh, Basinghall Street, um, the reason that's there, um, is it's the uh, it is only a distributed B street um, between Albany Highway and Berwick Street, not the whole thing, Basinghall Street. Um, so that's the reason for those two changes with two dot points. Thanks, Councillor Hendricks. Can I call, please, for a seconder? for the amendment. So seconded Councillor Hamer. Councillor Hendricks, do you wish to speak now to your proposed amendment? Um, it's just briefly and I've lost my wording so um, the when I was reading through the policy the first time I mentioned to go to um, wherever I'm not too sure I forgot the wording it mentioned to go somewhere um, which I did duly and to try and find meaning to to that particular cause it took me quite a while to find it and it ended up being um, just a small section of, of, of where um, of where to go. So I think having this there, it's going to make it easier for the public to um, to work out what all those listings of the streets um, are there for, and also save them um, seven second guessing. And it just makes it, it's just going to save time uh, for having to do that research. So I just think it makes perfect sense to have this recommendation. Thanks, Councillor Hendricks. Councillor Hayman, did you wish to speak as the seconder to the amendment? Nothing further from me. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Uh, is there any dissent? No, there being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. Now, Councillor Hendricks, as the mover uh, for the uh, recommendation as now amended, would you like to now substantively speak to the item? No, thank you, Mayor Verna. I'm happy with everything. Thank you. Um, and I think if my memory serves me correct, Councillor Karimi, you had seconded the officer recommendation. Did you wish to be heard about this item? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any dissent? 
No, there being no indication of dissent, I declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. We can now continue on with the agenda. So we now move to item 13, which is the Chief Operations Officer reports. Uh, item 13.1, the Kent Street Sandpit concept design. Um, the recommendation for this matter is that Council receives and endorses the Kent Street Sandpit concept design. And I have a mover and a second, please. Moved Councillor Devereaux, seconded Councillor Karimi. Councillor Devereaux, did you wish to be heard? Uh, just very briefly, uh, Mayor Vernon, I think there's been a lot of um, community interest in this work and I think it really dovetails uh, really nicely with other work that the town is doing uh, with its urban forest strategy and uh, other strategies. And I think uh, the, uh, the consultation and the work done so far has been uh, really positive and it's been well received. And so I'm very glad to be able to move it and support it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Devereaux. Councillor Karimi is the seconder. Do you wish to be heard? Uh, just briefly to say that um, I echo Councillor Devereaux's comments and uh, this is a really exciting project um, with so many amazing um, community groups involved and I really look forward to it um, continuing to progress. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Karimi. Um, I would like to ask just a couple of quick questions before I ask if there's anyone else who wishes to be heard on the matter. Um, I note in the concept plan there are what would be five nodes in total mixed between uh, feature nodes and other nodes. And my question for the administration is, is it intended that there will be that many nodes in the final delivered project or is that yet to be determined in the detailed design? Because it seemed a lot given community comments referring to trying to keep the area as pristine and native bushland as possible. So if I could direct that question to the Chief Operations Officer, Ms Adams, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, on the, the revised concept plan, there are three knowledge nodes and three feature nodes that are indicatively shown. And that was determined through the engagement that we did with the traditional owners. Um, as I said, these are indicative only and the final number will be determined at the detailed design stage. Thank you. Uh, my follow-up question is, as they appear on the concept plan, there seems to be some distance between the walking paths and the nodes. Will there be connections between the pathways into the nodes for accessibility purposes? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yes, there, there will be pathways. They're, they are shown probably up to about 15 metres off the current um, concept paths that are shown, but the access will all be... Um, as per all the paths within there, which is all accessible pathways. Thank you. In regards to the universally accessible ramp in the Barren Hay Court cul-de-sac corner just before Kent Street, how will the universally accessible ramp connect to Barren Hay Court and or through to Kent Street, will there be more accessible pathways to get from outside the sandpit site and onto that universally accessible ramp? 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So the path that is going to be from um, where the ramp is proposed to Baron Hay Court will be universally accessible. Um, we're hoping that will be pretty much near level for that whole length. And then from Baron Hay Court up to Kent Street, there is an existing, um, it's like a red asphalt path at the moment, but that doesn't currently meet um, accessibility standards, the Australian standards. So there would have to be modifications to that for um, for a standard accessible path between Kent Street and Baron Hay Court. Thank you. Would that be considered part of this project or would that have to be dealt with afterwards? So that part um, would not be included in this project and there are no um, pathways even along Kent Street that are included within this project. It would be separate. Are you aware of whether there is a crossover on Kent Street aligned with where Baron Hay Court is? So if someone was coming from the other side of Kent Street, crossing over Kent Street to get to the Sandpit site, that there's even, you know, a pedestrian walk through there? Uh, I can look that up. Um, as I said, there is a pathway that is going between Kent Street and um, and Baron Hay Court, and there are no pram ramps, to the best of my recollection, on either side. So I can I can have a look at that and um, take that part on notice. Okay. Thank you. Um, those were all my questions. Um, so uh, I'll now ask: Is there any dissent to this item? No, there being no dissent, declare that carried uh, unanimously. Thank you. Um, and can I just take this opportunity to thank the Friends of Jurda Up Bushland who a number of years ago brought a petition to council uh, seeking to advance the future restoration of this site. Um, they've been long-standing champions um, of what we would do with this site in the future. And I think they've managed to inspire a great number of our community to follow suit. Um, and share their support for um, the site's restoration and to thank uh, those members of our Madeira advisory group, including Professor Forrest and his wife, uh, for their contributions to assisting us to understand um, the Aboriginal cultural heritage of the site um, to the town of Victoria Park and also to Professor Kingsley Dixon from Curtin University, who's also been an advisor on the project, uh, both now and we hope into the future. So. Um, onwards and upwards for this project. Let's hope uh, the next stage um, comes to pass soon. Uh, that now brings us to uh, the next item on our agenda um, because item 13.2 has already been dealt with by exception resolution. Item 14, the Chief Financial Officer reports. 14.1 has already been dealt with by exception resolution. Uh, so we now come to item 14.2, which is the financial statements for March 2022, item that requires an absolute majority of council. Uh, the recommendation is that council, one, accepts the financial activity statement report 31 March 2022 as attached, two, accepts the budget amendment to increase library initiatives budget by $12,700, for the purchase of digital scanner and microfiche reader and $11,900 for software package items for printing solutions. Three, accepts the budget amendment to transfer $60,000 for old spaces, new places, public realm project number four to future fund reserve. Four, accepts the budget amendment to transfer $2,422,582 to appropriate reserves to allow for project delivery in future financial years when market conditions approve, improve, and five, accepts the budget amendment to transfer $55,000 from the community art reserve to fund painting of the mural of the town administration building. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, for the recommendation?
Moved Councillor Creamy, seconded Deputy Mayor Anderson. Um, Councillor Creamy, did you wish to be heard at this time? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson, did you wish to be heard at this time? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, I wish to move an amendment to this item. Um, the details of the amendment have been circulated previously to elected members. So uh, the amendment I would like to move is to delete point five of the recommendation. And I'll now uh, very briefly give uh, my reasons for moving this amendment. The town's officer report provides no explanation or justification for proposing a budget variation to approve a $55,000 mural to be painted on the outside of the town's administration building barely six weeks before the end of the financial year. It is immaterial in my view that there is sufficient funds in the public art reserve fund to cover this proposed cost. Building maintenance works under the current 21-22 annual budget included the painting of the exterior of the administration building. That work was completed in the first couple of months of this year. In light of the town's recommendation uh, in this agenda for the advertising of differential rates, that rates for the 22-23 year should increase by more than 4%, and having regard to the increasing cost of living, it is not, in my view, prudent to spend $55,000 on a mural to be painted on the outside of the administration building facing onto Shepparton Road, which in my view will essentially, essentially only be seen by passing motorists. Since the future of the administration building has not yet been finalised, it was appropriate to paint the exterior of the building for asset maintenance purposes. In light of the current economic climate, I believe that an expensive mural seems like an exercise in largesse at this stage and does not, in my view, pass the pub test. A preferable outcome would be to plan in the annual budget for 22-23 for public art projects that can enhance the public realm in more community accessible public open spaces throughout the town. Could I call please for a seconder for my proposed amendment? Uh, seconded Councillor Hamer. Um, I would just like to speak very briefly about this because I think most of what I've said is in the reasons. Uh, I wouldn't wish it to be thought that I'm against uh, public art in the form of murals. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, public art murals can be uh, a great way to reinvigorate uh, and enliven an area, but I think it's really important where you put them. They need to be placed in a location that will have the greatest impact and value to members of our community who can stop and enjoy them um, and indeed recreate uh, and gather in those spaces where such public art is available to them. Um, I do think this is a matter of being sensible at this time of the year, especially going into uh, a tough financial year ahead. Um, and at this stage, uh, much as uh, there may be plenty of funding currently sitting in the community art reserve, that of itself uh, does not, in my view, promote this project forward. It was not a planned project in the current budget that's been adopted, hence the variation that's proposed. And I feel like there are many competing claims from people in our community who would wish to see um, us spend money on things that will give them joy and amenity for many years to come such as shade sales in parks over children's playgrounds, um, uh, devices and equipment in the library, and the list literally goes on and on. And elected members have just been uh, through a number of um, pretty grilling budget workshops where we've had to look um, at our dollars and our cents, and I feel like this is one where we need to have some good sense. So please, I encourage elected members to support this. Uh, Councillor Hamer, as the seconder, do you wish to be heard? No, nothing from me. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Thank you. Is there anyone who wishes to speak against the amendment? Is there anyone who wishes to speak for the amendment? 
Deputy Mayor Anderson. Thank you, Mayor Van. And I'll just be brief in that I will be supporting the amendment. Um, and it is really in regards to using the art reserve for um, future planning and so having more thought put into it instead of a reaction position. Um, and I think, you know, in partnership with place planning, um, using the art reserve, we could do some beautiful activation for art that um, really reflects different areas of our community um, as we move into the uh, next financial year. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, is there anyone else who wish to speak on the item? Otherwise, I will close the debate. Um, so if there's no one else who wishes to speak, I'm going to close the debate by saying I've said all I need to say and I'm going to invite elected members to vote on the proposed amendment. I declare the amendment carried unanimously. So we now go back to the substantive item, um, which is the recommendation as amended, and ask, is there any dissent? There being no dissent, declare that matter carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to... Um, Item 15, committee reports, because 14.3 was dealt with by exception resolution. We have no committee reports. Item 16, applications for leave of absence. Recommendation is that uh, council approves a leave of absence for Councillor Luana Lissandro for the dates of 18 May to 13 July 2022, inclusive. Can I call please for a mover and a seconder for that recommendation? Moved Councillor Devereaux, seconded Councillor Karimi. Is there any dissent? There being no dissent, declare that carried unanimously. Uh, next item on the agenda is item 17, motion of which previous notice has been given. We have none. Item 18, questions from members without notice. Do we have any questions from elected members without notice? Councillor Hamer. Thank you, Mayor Vernon. Um, one, I just tried to answer myself, but couldn't find the answer on the town's website. What is the five advocacy positions the town has for this year? I can only see the advocacy election um, document. Is there something else I need to look at? All right, thank you. Um, I'm just checking to see if our manager of stakeholder relations, Ms. Ellis, is still with us. And it does not look like she is still with us. Um, it. Oh. Um, there's a 20, 20 I was going to say I was try, going to try and do them off the top of my head but um, I'm going to try and see if I can get through them all so um, because I have a feeling that they were five major infrastructure projects and so McCallum Park Active Zone is one uh, Edward Millen Park Upgrade is another um, uh, Macmillan Precinct uh, is a third. Lathlane Park Zone 1, the Perth Football Club Grandstand and New Community Sport and Recreation Facility is number four. And Mr CEO, uh, help a tired mayor out, please, with the fifth one. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, we're looking at, Madam Mayor, we're looking at uh, mid-tier transit and short range bus transit. That's yes, the final one? I believe it is. Great. All right. Thank you. 
So uh, we, we do have a resolution of council, Councillor Hamer, so if I had enough time, I could go on the town's website and search through council minutes previously, but um, there is one. But the advocacy policy that we adopted last year actually changes the timing of when we adopt new priorities because okay. we used to do them where we would settle on them at the end of the <clears> calendar year so they'd be commencing at the beginning of the new calendar year. And our policy now says that we align our advocacy priorities to the financial year. So that there'll be a proposal for the advocacy priorities going forward for the financial year. So the advocacies are project advocacies. They're not actually advocating on behalf of certain things or ideas. They're just uh, advocating for um, projects. They are whatever it is that council resolves upon. Oh, okay. um, so they can be. Um, for social priorities and I think um, indeed it was a member of our community who earlier was speaking actually read out to us uh, from the advocacy policy which is available on the town's website um, that it did talk about uh, advocacy in relation to social outcomes. So there is a broad spectrum um, of priorities that can be adopted by council. The fact that those projects were all infrastructure type projects was perhaps a reflection of the fact that we had been endorsing some of them for several years in a row. And when you're leading into a state government election and a federal government election, federal funding and obtaining that and state government funding and obtaining that for the delivery of those projects um, can be achieved through ongoing advocacy. So... Uh, keeping them front and centre, that was about keeping our eye on major projects and the desire of our community to see those ultimately delivered and our commitment to deliver them in the most cost-effective manner for our ratepayers and residents as possible. So it doesn't have to be. Um, it's what council determines at the time. Um, and usually we have a concept forum for elected members where we get to discuss, uh, we get given sticky dots with colours, um, we get to do a bit of brainstorming about the things that we think are important priorities going forward uh, for the community to be advocated for, and usually we end up getting um, a good indication going forward and then we get a report from the Manager of Stakeholder Relations about what has been proposed. So uh, watch, watch this space to come. Thanks for that answer. Ta. Thank you. Any other questions from elected members without notice? Uh, no, doesn't look like there are. Uh, so on that basis, um, we can move on to item 19, new business of an urgent nature introduced by decision in the meeting. We have none. Item 20 is public question time. Uh, and I'm delighted to see that we still have a member of the community who is with us in the online room. Um, would you like to ask any questions? Yes, um, I did notice that there was an item regarding Ed Mullen House that just seemed to disappear. I just wonder what happened to that. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Pruitt. Um, I wonder if you are actually able to reduce the noise in the background for us. That would be great. It sounds like you've probably managed to achieve that. Um, so, uh, yes, the Edward Mullen House um, Adaptive Redevelopment Project update uh, was adopted by exception resolution at the beginning of the meeting. So the recommendation for that item was for council to note the update, um, but I can ask um, our Chief Operations Officer, Ms Adams, if you're in a position to uh, provide a short summary of that item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we do have uh, Mr Denham with us who may be able to provide that um, summary. Um, that would be great. I'm happy to direct that question to uh, Mr. Denham, the Manager of um, Property Leasing and Development. Um, just looking for a very short, uh, succinct summary of that particular report to Council, which was an update. Thank you very much, Mayor Vernon. Um, yeah, yeah, the report is, uh, um, it is summarising the current position on, uh, on negotiations with, with Black Oak. 
uh, to implement the uh, Council's resolution of the 2nd of August 2021. Uh, we've provided the report uh, um, to try and inform the public as much and the councillors as much as we can of the state of play with those uh, negotiations with Black Oak. Uh, Black Oak have, uh, had submitted a uh, confidential commercial offer to the council, which was approved at the council's special meeting on the 2nd of August. So uh, Black Oak's uh, offer is, um, uh, is confidential and commercially sensitive. Um, uh, so the, the report is uh, providing some, but not all detail of, of the negotiations uh, with Black Oak. Um, uh, I, I don't know if the member of the public's got any specific question uh, in, in mind because the report does provide quite a lot of information. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Vernon. Uh, thanks, Mr Denham. I probably went over and above um, uh, our community member, Mr Pruitt's question. He had wanted to know what happened to the item um, and that was really because the item had been subsumed into the exception resolutions matters that we deal with at the outset, which are really for council to adopt on block um, a number of agenda items for which there is unlikely to be any disagreement uh, by councillors. So um, I'm sure that Mr Pruitt um, will have um, an opportunity to read through um, the officer's report providing that update. Uh, Mr Pruitt, was there any other questions that you had for us? No, that, that was everything, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, on that basis, uh, at 9.54pm, I'll close public question time. Uh, item 21 is public statement time. Um, since we do still have one member of the community with us, and it is Mr Pruitt, Mr Pruitt, do you have a statement that you would like to make to us tonight? No, I'm all very good. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Pruitt. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so I will now at 9.54pm close public statement time. Uh, item 22 of the agenda is uh, meeting close to the public. Um, item 22.1 on the agenda, we do have a matter for which the meeting uh, may be closed. Um, so I now move a procedural motion that Council 1 closes the meeting to the members of the public at 9.55pm to consider item 22.1.1 in accordance with section 5.23, subsection 2, subparagraph A of the Local Government Act 1995, and two, permits the Chief Executive Officer, the Manager of People and Culture, and the Meeting Secretary to remain in the electronic chamber where required in accordance with clause 27, subsection 3, subparagraph A of the Town of Victoria Park Meeting Procedures Local Rule 2019. Can I call, please, for... Um, a seconder to that procedural motion moved by myself. Uh, seconded by Councillor Karimi. Is there any dissent? No, there being no dissent, uh, declare that carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, now, we do move to somewhat of a different uh, process from now because I will inform elected members or remind you that we are doing the confidential section of this meeting using MS Teams. So you will be moving to the MS Teams meeting. Use the link, please, in your calendar invitation for tonight's council meeting. And when you move to the Teams meeting, you can leave your Zoom on, but please turn off your camera, turn off your microphone so that we cannot hear you. Uh, and in about a minute, I'll see you all in the electronic confidential meeting room. Thank you. Any members of the community who wish to wait, council meeting will be reopened in due course, but I cannot give an advice as to when. And for any members of staff, um, equally, I can advise you as to how long this item will take or when the meeting will resume, noting that it is the last item on the agenda before the close of business. Thank you.
Okay, there we are. So, um, all right. Uh, so everyone is now 10.42 p.m. and uh, we are back uh, out of closed session into uh, the meeting. And I can report um, with the meeting reopened to the public um, that uh, in relation to item 22.1.1, Council resolved that the resolution report and uh, that the report and its resolution remain confidential in accordance with section 5.23, subsection 2, subparagraph C, and 5.23, subsection 2, subparagraph E of the Local Government Act 1995, um, which is now read out. And uh, now at 10.43 p.m., uh, I declare this ordinary council meeting closed. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions to the debate tonight. Um, thank you to those who joined us uh, on live, online, uh, none of whom are left, not surprisingly. Um, and thank you to all of the town staff who assisted and participated in the meeting this evening. And to those who are still watching on live streaming, uh, thank you for your attendance and participation.